I'm not proud to admit it, but I've always been a bit of a chatterbox. Always have been, always will be, I guess. Not everyone appreciates my natural inclination to strike up a conversation with complete strangers, but hey, sometimes it's just too quiet at work. You see, I'm a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. While it can be peaceful out here, it can also get a little lonely. One seemingly uneventful morning, I had just started my shift, looking forward to the day ahead. As I embarked on my routine patrol, the scent of damp earth filled the air, courtesy of last night's thunderstorm. Just as I finished admiring the glistening dew on a giant red oak leaf, something caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. The sun didn't reach certain parts of the park yet because of the mountain shadows and dense foliage. There was something there, or rather someone, tangled up in our new fencing project designed to deter wild animals from wandering onto the public trails. It was an elderly woman clutching her tattered shawl tightly around her shoulders. She was covered in scratches and appeared shaken, like she'd seen something truly terrifying. Ma'am, I called out cautiously not wanting to alarm her further. I'm Ranger Francis Esterman. How can I help you? Oh, thank goodness. She stuttered between shallow breaths. There's something out there. Something horrible. Concern spread across my face as she continued her story. She described seeing an indescribable entity lurking within the forest depths while she was gathering herbs for her tonics and healing balms. If it hadn't been for your fence here, she paused and glanced uncertainly at the wire mesh barrier that now lay in tatters. It would have had me. What did it look like? I asked, desperate to have some sort of image to which I could mentally cling. Well, she hesitated. It was tall and unnaturally thin, with elongated limbs and those eyes. She closed her own eyes, shivering. Cold, lifeless eyes that seemed to pierce through my soul. I had heard of folklore creature sightings around the park before, but something about her frantic demeanor made me take her more seriously than is usual in these incidents. Listen, I said gently, as we began walking to my truck parked nearby. You're safe now. Let's get you to a hospital and get you taken care of. The drive back was filled with tense silence which weighed heavily on my mind. The thought occurred to me that I'd never encountered anyone this seriously frightened about any folktale or any rural myth. Once at the hospital, I filled out a report for my superiors and ensured that the elderly woman received proper medical care. She thanked me repeatedly, as if I'd miraculously saved her life. After the hospital visit, I mulled over what she'd shared earlier struggling to push it out of my mind as I returned to my patrol. But that proved easier said than done, especially when another emergency call crackled through the radio just an hour later. Ranger Esterman, please respond, came the voice of Judy, one of our dispatch personnel. Go ahead, I replied, trying to stay focused on the road in front of me. There's a group of missing hikers last seen near Black Rock Pond. Meet up with Ranger Max at the trailhead. He'll take the lead from there. Roger that. My unassuming attempt at acknowledging orders masked every worry thrashing around in my head already. As Max briefed our group about the search mission, all my thoughts kept drifting back toward the damaged fencing and what horrifying fate awaited those poor missing souls. Max clapped his hands, making me startle slightly from my thoughts. All right, team. Let's do what we were trained for. From that moment on, things began to spiral fast. One by one, the people we'd been searching for seemed to suffer similar tales of distress and disorientation, haunted by an increasingly familiar primeval terror. It wasn't long before panic gripped the entire park. Reports from park guests surged in like a tidal wave as we desperately tried to make sense of it all. I rushed to meet Ranger Max at the trailhead near Black Rock Pond, other rangers and volunteers gathered around Max as he divided us into search teams. Each team received a map with the missing hikers' last known locations. As we set off on our search, I couldn't help but notice signs of something sinister lurking in the area. 
broken tree branches, animal carcasses, and more damaged fencing. The hikers we found were terrified, telling us of a monstrous creature that stalked them through the woods. With each new report, it was becoming clear that there was an unknown attacker preying on the park. This realization made all of us even more determined to find the remaining missing hikers. Not wanting to overshadow our current mission, we refrained from openly discussing this mysterious creature, even though fear gnawed at us all. One evening, while out searching for another missing hiker with my team, we heard a blood-curdling scream in the distance. We immediately headed towards the sound and found one of the missing hikers alive but badly injured. He told us between gasps that an enormous beast had attacked him from behind before vanishing into the woods. With no time to dwell on his story, we needed medical attention for him right away. But there were no cell phone signals in that part of the forest, so two team members carried him back to park headquarters while I continued searching for the remaining hikers. With every passing moment, the fear mounted as darkness enveloped the forest. Eventually, I discovered another group of hikers hiding in a makeshift shelter they had constructed to avoid potential danger. They were too afraid to leave their shelter without assistance and begged me for help getting back to safety. There were too many people for me to escort on my own through the dangerous territory while also navigating in the dark. With no other options available to me, I had to make a temporary camp for the injured hiker and the remaining hikers until daybreak. The agonizing night was filled with terrifying noises and distant growls, but we managed to hold our positions until morning. At first light, I led the group back to park headquarters with my heart racing, expecting an attack at any moment. Upon reaching safety, park officials and local authorities decided to temporarily close down Black Rock Pond for public safety. Emergency responders tended to the injured hiker, who survived his injuries. Meanwhile, more reports of strange sightings and attacks around the park led to a massive search for whatever was terrorizing people. Despite extensive searches involving numerous law enforcement personnel and professional trackers, they found no trace of this aggressive creature. For us park rangers tasked with rescuing vulnerable hikers, these events have left us haunted. Losing colleagues and witnessing innocent people fall victim to this unknown menace will stay with us for the rest of our lives. Over time, things seemed to calm down as fewer incidents occurred within the park. The missing hikers' families mourned their loved ones in solemn memorials, leaving a grim reminder that sometimes mysteries are better left unsolved. Even though I await a day when answers reveal themselves about our terrifying ordeal amongst those dark trees surrounding Black Rock Pond, life has had no choice but to go on. After some time, I found out that what I encountered was a Wendigo, a monstrous beast from Native American legends that's driven by an insatiable hunger for human flesh and possesses supernatural abilities like changing its size or vanishing into thin air. The Wendigo had been awakened by unknown forces and wrought havoc on our community before disappearing without a trace. It's disconcerting to know that a creature like that could still be lurking nearby, waiting for its next opportunity to strike. But it is our sworn duty as park rangers to protect both our parks and those who visit them from harm's way, and we will continue to do so even in the face of unspeakable horrors. I woke up with the morning sun streaming through my window, a feeling of dread nagging at the back of my mind. I'm David Hensley, recently moved to Hartford, Connecticut after losing my job. Downsizing, they said, but I think it was just bad luck. My mornings usually started with a walk through nearby Mugford Park, nothing like a brisk hike in nature to clear the head. As I ambled through the park, a peculiar scene caught my eye. The usually bustling area felt unnervingly empty. Police tape marked off a section where I noticed a few detectives discussing something intently. You're not supposed to be here, said one of them, Spencer Fenton. He recognized me from our weekly poker games. What happened? I asked. Missing person, Spencer replied without giving away any further information. 
In the following days, more reports of missing people surfaced across town. Theories spread amongst locals about abductions or escaping criminals on the loose. While skeptical about these wild rumors, I couldn't shake off an uneasy feeling growing within me. Late one evening, returning home after another poker session with Spencer and our friends Tabitha Gorski and Ezra Campion, I found myself drawn to revisit Mugford Park, hoping to spot something that could give meaning to this strange uneasiness. The park had an eerie quietness at night, as if hiding some untold secret. My eyes scanned the surrounding trees and shadows swaying in tune with the wind. Suddenly, my gaze halted on what appeared to be two points of light flickering in the distance. Curiosity overtook me as I ventured further towards those glimmering points deep within the woods. Drawing nearer, they seemed like eyes watching me from afar, large amber orbs suspended in midair. Between them hung muscle-bound arms bearing fur-covered hands that ended in sharp claws. A growl rumbled through the air, and I realized it was a humanoid wolf creature looming over me. My skepticism crumbled into panic as I backed away slowly, not wanting to attract its attention. Reality distorted as my rational mind fought to comprehend the entity before me. The creature lunged towards me with incredible speed. I barely had time to duck behind a tree for cover. Words bubbled up, my mind racing to find the right ones. W what do you want? My voice trembled. It didn't respond, instead stalking around the park with menacing intent. Suddenly, it let out an earth-shattering howl that made my bones tremble. Every muscle in my body tensed, preparing me for the impending clash. As I braced myself against the tree, my hand found a sturdy broken branch, jagged at one end but durable enough. I gripped it tightly, as if it were the last thread of hope in this ominous encounter. Peeking around the corner, I saw Ezra and Tabitha approaching hesitantly. Their fearful faces suggested they too had heard the howl. I motioned for them to stay back or risk provoking this beast further. The wolf creature roamed closer, muscles rippling beneath its thick fur coat. My breath hitched in my throat as it appeared capable of unspeakable horrors, witnessed only by those unfortunate enough never to live after the ordeal. Tabitha carried a firearm, but never fired it outside of shooting practice. In any case, with bystanders so close, taking a shot put all of our lives at even greater risk. Why isn't anyone calling for help? Ezra whispered. Because no one would believe us, Tabitha snapped back quietly. As we crouched behind trees and bushes watching this monstrous beast creep ever closer, Spencer appeared nearby looking pale and confused as he observed our hushed gathering. I signaled Spencer to remain silent and join us as the wolf-like creature continued its prowl. Every step it took seemed calculated, deliberate, a predator stalking its prey. Any ideas? I whispered to Tabitha, hoping she had some kind of plan tucked away in her mind. A generation of hunting experience must have led her to some knowledge on how to deal with this situation. We need to find a way out of here without drawing its attention, she responded, keeping her eyes locked on the menacing creature. If we try to call for help, it will just aggravate it further and put others in danger too. Ezra seemed to be evaluating his options as well. He scanned the area around us, searching for any possible paths away from this nightmare. Guys, there's a back entrance to the park in that direction, he whispered pointing towards a faint trail through the wooded area. If we move slowly and stay low, we might be able to make it out without getting its attention. It was not much of a plan, but it was better than waiting for the creature to discover us cowering amongst the foliage. We began inching our way towards the trail as stealthily as possible, trying desperately not to make any noise that would alert the beast. Moments felt like hours as we moved slowly and cautiously. Sweat dripped down my face while adrenaline coursed through my veins. I constantly glanced back towards the creature. Each time I took my eyes off it felt like taking an enormous risk. As we finally approached the trail exit, another howl filled the park, closer than before. The creature's ears perked up, and its gaze landed directly on our hiding spot. 
my heart sank as I saw recognition and hunger flash through its eyes. Run! Tabitha screamed, possibly realizing that stealth was no longer an option. We sprinted down the trail as fast as our legs would allow, the thunderous growls and snarls of the creature chasing us from behind, echoing through the park. Panic surged through us, and I feared for our lives with every step we took. Suddenly, there was a loud bang. Tabitha had fired her gun at the creature. For a moment, its gait slowed, but it only seemed to enrage it further. The beast leaped towards Tabitha, teeth bared, aiming for her neck. Without thinking, I swung my makeshift weapon at it. The jagged branch connected with its skull with a sickening crunch. Blood splattered across the ground as the creature stumbled backward, giving us a brief window to increase the distance between us. We didn't stop running until we reached my car parked near the entrance of the park. Our chests heaved as we gulped down air, finally feeling safe enough to process what had just unfolded. I can't believe that just happened, Spencer panted. We barely made it out alive, Ezra added between gasps for breath. What? What was that thing? I racked my brain trying to find some logical explanation for our only encounter that didn't involve supernatural entities or myths. Despite my limited knowledge of folklore and mythology, one word found its way to the forefront of my mind. Werewolf. As Ezra and Spencer exchanged worried glances, I leaned back against my car and thought about what had transpired in the once peaceful park. We knew better than to return there without weapons or a plan, frightened by our gruesome encounter with an otherworldly creature hell-bent on tearing us apart. The fates of those who came before us weighed heavily on our thoughts as we drove away from the scene. Whispers of their stories echoed in our minds, while the fading howls of that night haunted our dreams for years to come. I stepped onto the porch of my cabin, overlooking the thick forests of Montana. My name is Orville Hemmings, and I came here to escape my hectic city life. I was a teacher until my beloved wife passed away last year, and I needed some solitude. So I turned to this cabin in the woods. The first couple of days were uneventful as I settled in. On the third day, my nearest neighbor Cecil Kwiatkowski came by to introduce himself and give me a chilling warning. There's something out there, he muttered, glancing nervously around. Be careful, Orville. What are you talking about? Cecil looked at me sternly. My cousin was mauled near here last month. It was unlike anything the forest rangers had seen before. It was hard to believe him then. But on the fifth day, I found a slaughtered deer in my yard. Its head was entirely missing, its entrails spilling everywhere. I decided it was time to speak to another neighbor about what Cecil had told me. Elma Burgriff lived just two miles down the road, so she seemed like a safe bet. Elma invited me into her cozy cabin where we sat drinking warm tea, but no mention of coffee or shivers. Cecil is right, she confided fearfully. There's a creature out there that's attacked many of us locals in recent weeks, and it's been stalking people. Kids from town have gone missing. Now alarmed, I returned to my cabin more vigilant than ever. My peaceful escape suddenly felt dangerous. Later that night, as I huddled under the blanket with an old paperback novel in hand, I suddenly heard heavy thumping outside, like something large and heavy was walking along the edge of my property. Quietly picking up my shotgun from above the fireplace and loading it with trembling hands, I ventured outside. The night was dark and cold. I couldn't see much, but I could hear the thumping now closer, coming from the woods. Then a stench of rot struck my nostrils. It had to be the creature. I called Cecil and Elma for help, but there was no signal. My heart raced as I realized I was isolated. As I moved closer to the tree line, a blur came hurtling towards me. Sounds of tearing and crashing filled my ears as enormous claws struck just inches from my face. It broke into my vision suddenly, an otherworldly beast standing seven feet tall with scaly skin, sharp needle-like teeth, and its eyes, bright, 
intelligent, and terrifying in their emptiness. I fired at it instinctively and staggered back. My shot hit something solid, causing the creature to scream out in a guttural rage that shook me to my bones. It wheeled around, hissing and snarling as if assessing me, then lunged again with brutal force. The conflict became gruesome, close-range shotgun blasts tearing into its unyielding flesh while its claws raked across my skin like razors, drawing crimson rivulets down my arms. I fought for my life, fueled by adrenaline under a moonlit sky, while the forsaken creature raged through the darkness, relentless in its pursuit of ending me, just as it did other prey before. A sudden gunshot rang through the air from an unknown source. Was it Cecil? Elma? I couldn't be sure, but one thing became evident. Another foe had joined the battle against this monstrous antagonist. Determined not to fall victim to this beast's reign of terror instilled in our quaint forest community, I pressed on through each vicious assault with renewed hope that this nightmare would soon end. But with every swing of its claws and shattering impact against tree trunks as we grappled through the woodland labyrinth, I began to doubt my ability to survive. As I struggled to keep my footing, I could hear the groans and screams of pain from an unknown ally. Cecil? Elma? Whoever it was, they seemed to be locked in their own battle against the monstrosity that plagued our once quiet forest. The gritty determination that surged through me only grew stronger with every second spent fighting this horrific enemy. In a frenzy, I scrambled away from the creature's grasp, desperate to gain some distance and precious time to think of a plan. The relentless creature followed, each step emitting a sickening crunch as it crushed everything in its path. A sudden sharp pain twisted through my left arm as the beast landed another blow. I gasped under the immense agony. Realizing I needed to act fast or die at the hands of this merciless being, I searched my surroundings for something, anything, that might aid me. That's when I noticed a cabin nearby. Not wasting any time, I sprinted towards it while narrowly dodging another flying strike from the creature. Its massive forearm left an indentation on the very tree trunk I was beside moments before. I charged into the cabin and slammed the door shut behind me without looking back. My breath came in ragged gasps as painful lungs and wounds begged for relief. But there was no time for healing. I had to find a way to immobilize this monster or call for help. But how? Phones were non-existent in this remote area and no one could hear my desperate callings through these dense woods. My panicked eyes darted around the room for answers, but found nothing but dusty shelves filled with old books and trinkets. There was nothing here that'd serve any practical use against such a vicious foe. The door suddenly buckled under an immense force from outside, shattering wood splinters across the floor and slicing mercilessly through my arm. Fear dominated me as I saw the blood gushing from my wound, it would not take long before I bled out. The crashing sound of an axe snapping through the door caught my attention as Cecil swung mightily trying to fend off the beast, Elma standing slightly off to his side. They managed to distract it, relieving me from immediate harm but prolonging the inevitable. That monster would not rest until every last one of us would be dead. I needed to do something. Fast. The sudden flash of cold steel caught my eye as I spotted a metal trap hanging on the wall amidst cobwebs. With a surge of hope, I grabbed it and fiddled with my trembling fingers to set up the jaws that could potentially secure our future. A few seconds felt like eternities as sweat dripped down my face, adding salt onto the wounds that served constant painful reminders. The creature let out a furious roar as if realizing what I was planning but I refused to falter now. With a final, controlled movement, I positioned the trap exactly where I wanted. Elma yelled out as they saw what my intentions were. Bring it over here! Cecil and Elma sprinted towards me, leading the beast closer with every heartbeat. My heart pounded violently in my chest like a stampede, but I stood my ground. As it charged towards us, bellowing with unrelenting vengeance, time appeared to slow down. Blood staining its jagged teeth drew too close for comfort, 
if we didn't act right now. We were dead men walking. With all my remaining strength, I pushed the trap in its path, just as Cecil and Elma dodged its murderous claws. The sharp jaws snapped shut around the creature's foot, stopping it in its tracks and forcing it into an unearthly howl of pain, or maybe rage. With the creature momentarily subdued by our makeshift entrapment, we took no chances. We escaped that repulsive being as quickly as possible, heading back to the civilization we thought we knew so well. As we walked away, I couldn't help but wonder what kind of otherworldly nightmare we had just encountered. My only solace was the hope of never encountering one again, but deep down, I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that our reality had changed. Forever. A lasting effect of the unknown terror. In whispers that echoed throughout the forest, I began to believe there were other beings still out there waiting for us. This happened to me a few summers ago. My friend, Walter Severs, and I decided to go on a hiking trip in the vast forests of Oregon. It was meant to be one last adventure before settling into our mundane jobs. The first two days went smoothly. One evening, while cooking some beans at our campsite, I remember talking with Walter about his wife and how he dreamt of better days soon. Just then, we heard rustling nearby and saw a tall figure in the distance but shrugged it off as it disappeared as quickly as it came. The next day, we met Mara Kolesnik, another hiker who mentioned she couldn't find her way back to her group. After hearing her story, we agreed that she'd stay with us until morning. We sat by the fire sharing some good banter and laughter over life's peculiarities. As dawn broke, we stumbled upon one of the most gruesome things I'd ever seen. Several bodies were mutilated along the trail. Frozen in shock, Walter whispered, we should turn back and inform the authorities. However, Mara refused to go back without her friends. Too deep into unfamiliar territory but unable to abandon Mara's dilemma, we kept going against our better judgment. Walking silently through the hauntingly beautiful landscape, Walter leading the way, we cautiously explored abandoned cabins and noticed shadows lurking behind trees. What do you think is going on? Mara asked anxiously. Small chance it's wildlife predation, I whispered, my skepticism rising. But by the looks of it, it doesn't add up. We finally discovered an isolated waterfall hiding in the wilderness. Next to it was Alice Dresdenke tied to a tree, Mara's closest friend, bruised around the eyes and unconscious. We frantically cut her free and asked what had happened. Before Alice could reply, she weakly pointed behind us towards the eerie woods and whispered, Them. Suddenly, Heavy footsteps and whispers emerged. The footsteps were deliberately spaced to make a calculated approach, while the whispers hinted at a gleeful satisfaction in our predicament. Walter nudged Mara to hide behind a nearby rock. We got ready with our guns and knives, straining our eyes to make out anything useful in the rapidly waning light. The three looming figures crept closer and closer, showing no fear. Walter silently swore under his breath, which is odd for he usually took things in stride. The first figure approached us from behind a bush, and its appearance was nothing short of horrifying. A large man wearing animal skins, his eyes wild and hair matted, almost like a human beast. His companions appeared from the tree line, one slender form wielding firearms, and another brutish hulk heaving a large mallet. They began to circle us like hungry predators waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Our hearts pounding we formed a tight circle defensively waiting for something, anything. When they made their move, we fought back with everything we had. We had no choice but to retaliate and try to make sense of this nightmare. All of a sudden, Alice let out an agonizing scream. Swift as an arrow, an unseen assailant dragged her towards the darkness. We tried grabbing hold of her hands, reaching out but hopeless against the assailant's relentless pull. In that moment, we had to make a choice. I glanced at Walter and Mara, and without speaking a word, our decision was unanimous. We had to save Alice. We lunged towards her, trying to gain the upper hand on her attacker. As we got closer, we could see that the person responsible for dragging Alice away was another member of the cannibalistic mountain men. He was wearing tattered clothes with patches of dried blood all over them. 
His nails were long and sharp like claws. It was terrifying to look at him, but we couldn't afford to let fear take over. Walter grabbed a large branch from the ground and charged at the mountain man holding Alice. He swung it with every ounce of strength he had, connecting with the side of the guy's head. The assailant staggered and released his grip on Alice, who fell limply onto the ground. I quickly pulled Alice towards us as Mara took charge and tried to fend off two more aggressive mountain men headed in our direction. She used her knife expertly, but struggled against their overwhelming strength. These men were much bigger than any normal human being. Walter decided that it was time to call for help, since we were no match for these terrifying figures who had appeared from nowhere. He took out his phone and dialed 911 as fast as he could, while simultaneously keeping an eye out for any movement from our assailants. The 911 operator picked up immediately, and Walter tried to explain where we were, that we were in those eerie woods being attacked by a group of savage-looking mountain men. However, his voice trembled as he attempted to provide more specific details about our location. It seemed like forever, as each minute dragged on while Walter stayed on the line with the emergency dispatcher. The fact that we had no idea if help would arrive in time only escalated our anxiety. The mountain men continued their relentless pursuit, showing no signs of slowing down or giving up. We had no choice but to keep moving and try to stay one step ahead of them. Our hearts raced as we struggled to keep up, leaving us drained and gasping for air. As the hours went by, we eventually managed to escape their clutches and found a safe place to hide. Walter stayed on the line with the operator ensuring that help was on its way. Finally, we saw the first signs of rescue, red and blue flashing lights slicing through the darkness. With our hearts pounding in our ears from adrenaline and exhaustion, we came out of hiding and approached the police officers who rushed to our aid. They encircled us protectively, keeping a wary eye on the woods as they radioed for additional support. Surprisingly, it wasn't long before they apprehended the mountain men responsible for Alice's near demise. The grisly sight of these animalistic figures being detained by police was strangely satisfying, yet harrowing at the same time. Once the ordeal was over and our attackers were behind bars, we found ourselves reeling from everything that happened. We took some comfort in knowing that these vicious mountain men would never again be able to terrorize anyone else. Days turned into weeks and our lives began to return to normalcy. Yet what happened in those woods still haunted us. Every time we closed our eyes at night, we could see their wild expressions or hear their whispers approach like ghosts in the night. Walter lamented about what could have happened if he hadn't decided to call for help that night. Our swift, rational decision had saved Alice, and likely ourselves, from a terrible fate. Alice hesitantly embarked on her journey towards recovery from her close encounter with death, we supported her through therapy sessions, kept a close watch over her emotional health, and reminded her every day that she wasn't alone in this battle. Walter, Mara, and I would always be by her side. What transpired during that ordeal became a stark lesson for the four of us. As strange as it may sound, it brought us closer together, cementing our bond. We overcame fear and faced a nightmarish reality head-on. Life would never be the same again, but at least we had each other to lean on in the face of life's darkest moments. I'm Simon, and I work for a task force that hunts and tracks monsters. Today, we're stationed somewhere deep in the Appalachian Mountains, awaiting our next assignment. The dense forest has an eerie silence as birdsong from earlier ceased abruptly. I remember growing up in a small town not too far from here. Life was simple then. My team leader, Gideon Blakely, joined me by the fire while waiting for others to return with more information on our target. He cracked a light-hearted joke about how cold it was and wished he'd brought warmer socks. The recon squad returned half an hour later with a gruesome sight body parts strewn about, blood painting the foliage. Elena Suarez, a member of our unit, described in detail how she'd found them. They were experienced hikers who met their end in this wretched forest. With no time to waste, we began tracking what had killed those poor souls, some sort of animalistic creature, unlike any we'd ever encountered before. Our search led us through thickets of twisted branches, 
and into a clearing bathed in moonlight. A sound caught our attention. It was like multiple growls combined into one guttural tune. Our hands gripped our weapons as adrenaline surged through us. There it stood, an unknown beast silhouetted against the night sky. Its massive frame towered over us like an asymmetrical nightmare come true. It had horns on its misshapen head and quills covering its body like armor. The creature eyed us hungrily before letting out a deafening roar that shook the ground beneath our feet. As a team, we moved in formation and opened fire, but it hardly seemed phased by our projectiles. It charged toward us with intense speed despite its heavy frame. Marcus Fitzgerald, another teammate of ours, made the mistake of letting his surprise linger for too long. In a flash, the beast was upon him, sinking its grotesque fangs into his shoulder. Marcus screamed in agony as the creature tossed him aside like a rag doll. The rest of us continued to fire at the monstrous entity as it tore through our ranks with ease. It was all too clear that conventional weapons were ineffective against this beast. In a frenzy of action, Gideon shouted at me to find cover and call for backup. I scrambled away from the chaos, heart pounding like a jackhammer, and found temporary safety behind an enormous oak. Surrounded by death and carnage, I yelled into my radio requesting urgent assistance. As if in response to my plea, the forest once again fell eerily silent. Hidden amongst the trees, awaiting reinforcements, I chanted a mantra I'd learned as a child to keep my nerves steady. The pain lancing through my injuries made it difficult to focus. Did you hear that? Elena whispered through chattering teeth, pale and wide-eyed as she huddled beside me. Unable to respond due to fear prickling down my spine, I simply stared at Elena and wondered who would be next. Before we had any more time to ponder on our fate or plan an escape route, the sound of snapping branches echoed through the woods. The monstrous silhouette emerged yet again, its blood-red eyes filled with malice. Suddenly, I realized our only chance of survival was to fight back, but not with weapons. Those were useless. Instead, I looked for the creature's weaknesses. That's when I noticed it. Every time we fired at it, the creature flinched from the sound. Everyone, yell as loud as you can, I shouted to my remaining teammates. They seemed confused, but followed my lead. Our collective screams echoed through the forest, disorienting the creature momentarily. It recoiled and stumbled away from us. Backing away from the beast, we moved quickly while still trying to maintain a close eye on it. The creature roared in frustration and charged us once again. Make more noise, Gideon commanded, understanding my strategy. We clapped our hands and banged on tree trunks to create even more noise, trying to pierce its sensitive hearing. The creature screeched in pain with each increasing wave of sound. One of my teammates dashed off toward our vehicles parked at a nearby clearing. I've got an idea, he hollered. While we continued making noise, our teammate returned dragging a large metal plate behind him, a spare part from one of our armored vehicles. Everyone grab something, hit this plate as hard as you can, he instructed. We quickly complied, using weapon stocks and other objects to strike the metal plate loudly. The resulting cacophony assaulted the monster's ears. The effect was immediate. It writhed in pain and collapsed to its knees. Our team took advantage of this momentary weakness and rushed at the creature, restrained it with any material we could find. Ropes, chains, and even branches torn from trees, tightly securing it so that it couldn't break free. As we stepped back to survey our makeshift capture, I noticed something about the creature. It had clear physical traits resembling various wild animals, parts of a bear, a wolf, and an elk but it was nothing I'd ever encountered before. It seemed like some hybrid beast, a freak of nature. How could such a creature even exist? Elena, still trembling, turned to me with an intense look in her eyes. What are we going to do with it? She asked. Call for backup and report this creature, I replied. They must know about it. Maybe they'll have some answers. While we watched the subdued beast, Gideon spoke up solemnly. 
We should remember Marcus and others who didn't make it. Their sacrifice led us here. I nodded in agreement, honoring those we had lost in the horrifying attack. Finally, our backup arrived along with two teams of researchers who had experience dealing with unidentified creatures. As they took over, documenting the details and planning their transport of the creatures safely away from here for study, I couldn't help but wonder what other unknown dangers might be lurking out there. Together, we had survived this encounter and learned the importance of adapting to unprecedented situations. The haunting memory of our fallen friends would stay with us forever, a reminder always to stay vigilant as we faced new challenges in the uncertain world that we lived in. It all started with a peculiar smell, like rotten eggs. My name is Akacheta Greywind, and I've been living in the Tohono O'odham Nation Reservation in Arizona for as long as I could remember. On the day it began, I came back to the reservation after delivering groceries to an elderly couple who lived in the nearby town. As I walked past the community center, I noticed a group of people gathering around something on the ground. Curiosity peaked. I squeezed through the crowd to catch a glimpse. They had discovered a mutilated body with strange markings that none of us recognized. We need to call the police, said Magina Two Heels, an ex-soldier turned community activist. Coda White Cloud, a local business owner, shook his head. The police won't help us out here. Magina sighed but didn't challenge him further. In our reservation, we were no strangers to crime. There were drug dealings, broken families, and disappearances, just like any other place in America. However, this was different. It was sinister. Over the following weeks, more bodies appeared along the trails in the woods surrounding our community. The victims had similar deep gashes across their corpses and that same eerie smell lingering around them. It was as if whatever caused these deaths wanted us to know it was coming for more. One night, while walking home from the town where I worked part-time at a grocery store, I felt like someone, or something, was watching me. The hairs on my arms stood on end, my heart raced with each step I took through the illuminated path. Suddenly, there was movement in the darkness off to my right side. Startled, I immediately picked up a rock from the ground in self-defense and called out, Who's there? Show yourself! A massive creature emerged from behind a tree, radiating a putrid odor. It was like something out of a twisted nightmare. Large, bird-like feet with sharp claws, a muscular body covered in iridescent scales, and massive wings that unfolded behind it. The beast let out a deafening screech. I wished there were someone nearby to call for help, but the reservation houses were few and far between. Panic set in as I contemplated my next move. Remembering the hunting equipment back at my house, I decided to make a run for it. The creature followed suit, quickly closing the distance between us with its monstrous speed. This was no ordinary wildlife predator. I barely made it through my front door when the creature slammed into it with a force that nearly brought down the entire structure. Breathing heavily and praying it doesn't break through, I grabbed my father's old shotgun and fired toward the door. For a moment, there was silence, until the door splintered inwards and the fearsome creature lunged through, wingtips brushing against walls. Desperate, I fired another shot directly at its chest. The resulting force knocked the beast back through the doorway into the night. Wounded and furious, it roared at me one last time before vanishing into the darkness but my heart told me that it wasn't gone for good, that this wouldn't be our last encounter. The following day, I recounted my harrowing experience to Magina and Coda. To my relief, they believed me without hesitation. Maybe we should form our own search party, suggested Coda. Gather volunteers from around the reservation and find this thing ourselves. Our search party was assembled with little delay, it seemed that fear had motivated our community into action quicker than anything else could have done. Each day we tread through miles of trees canvassing for any sign of the creature. The smell of decay hung heavy in certain areas as though something unnatural was lurking nearby. We found no substantial evidence other than claw marks and half-eaten livestock. The longer our search continued, the deeper our feelings of unease grew. What were we dealing with? Could we really stop it? 
or would this nightmare be forever etched into our lives? Day after day, we scoured the woods without finding a trace of the beast. It was like it vanished into thin air, just as quickly as it appeared that night, when it nearly broke into my house. The people were nervous, but also determined to find the creature. We all knew we couldn't rest until it was gone. As days turned into a week, our search party's numbers started dwindling. People were getting tired and scared. We began to wonder whether we should seek outside help. Was our small group genuinely equipped to handle this? Coda considered this option, too. Perhaps we should call for professional help. There must be some organization out there familiar with unusual creatures. Magina nodded in agreement. I think Coda is right. Our search party is not enough anymore. We need someone with experience in tracking and capturing creatures like this one. After debating for a while, we decided to send word to the authorities. Word about our animal attacks had reached them already, prompting them to send an experienced hunter named Mason Cole. When he arrived at our community on the second week of our ordeal, everyone breathed a sigh of relief. Finally, we might have a chance at stopping this thing. Mason was a tall and muscular man, everything you'd imagine in an expert hunter and tracker, with years of experience under his belt. He listened carefully as we explained what happened and shared whatever information we could. He thought for a moment before speaking up. Based on everything you've told me, sounds like you're dealing with some kind of large feline predator. Considering the maimed livestock and claw marks, he painstakingly detailed his reasoning for believing it was a feline creature, an escaped exotic pet, or perhaps something else foreign to our land. Mason split us into smaller groups to cover more ground efficiently with specific instructions and safety protocols. With Mason's guidance, our sense of hope returned, and we pressed forward, determined to stop the creature once and for all. On the third day after Mason's arrival, our group came across an abandoned cabin deep in the woods. Just as we approached, a low growl rumbled from within. It sounded like nothing I had ever heard before. Guttural, menacing, a violent promise of pain. Frozen in place, I glanced at the rest of my team. Fear clouded every face. We knew it was inside there. Without hesitation, Mason raised his rifle, ready to take action. The door of the cabin creaked open, revealing the massive creature in all its terrifying glory. It stood on four legs. Its body was muscular and covered in thick, dark fur. The head resembled a large cat, but distorted by its elongated jaw filled with razor-sharp teeth. Mason fired a shot, hitting the beast in its shoulder. It roared and charged towards us while Magina screamed and Coda tried to steady his aim. Splitting up as instructed, one half running for cover, the other aiming their weapons, the group took turns firing at the beast. We fought with everything we had while Mason landed several more shots into the creature before it finally collapsed onto the ground. Its lifeless body now only signified terror rather than embodying it. Exhausted and shaken but alive, we returned to our community with one less threat looming over us. When we arrived, we were greeted with gratitude by everyone who remained behind. Unexpectedly, they clapped on our backs and cheered as Mason solemnly informed them that he'd make arrangements for the creature's body to be dealt with. They'd ensure that no one else would ever have to face such a harrowing experience with this monster again. In spite of our victory against this creature, our hearts hung heavy as we remembered those who fell victim to this nightmare people taken from their lives far too soon. In those quiet, reflective moments, we swore to maintain our vigilance so that whoever remained in our community could live in peace. As life returned to normal over the following days, questions about the creature's origin still filled our minds. The ordeal left scars on our very souls, but at least we could now sleep without the fear of something lurking just beyond our doorsteps. And though we prayed never to encounter such danger again, we knew we had faced it together and survived. It was the hottest day of August when my buddies and I decided to take a spontaneous camping trip to escape the sweltering heat of the city. The weather forecast predicted cooler temperatures up in the serene mountains of Colorado so it seemed like the perfect opportunity for some camaraderie and outdoor exploration. Little did we know what awaited us in those lush, green woods. Our group consisted of myself, Mike, 
a tech-savvy programmer with a wicked sense of humor. Sarah, an adventurous soul with impeccable navigational skills. And our mutual friend Eddie, a gentle giant who had an uncanny ability to strike up interesting conversations with anyone he came across. We gathered at my apartment on Saturday morning, double-checking our supplies and planning our route before hitting the road. As we drove, I shared a funny anecdote about my recent misadventures at the DMV, while Mike chimed in with his own tales of software development disasters. Juxtaposed with these light-hearted topics was Sarah's recounting of local mountain lore she'd been researching, which only added to the anticipation for our weekend retreat. When we arrived at our designated campsite nestled within the sprawling coniferous forest, we immediately set up and began preparing dinner on our portable stove. Soon after we devoured our meal, I noticed something strange hanging from a nearby tree, like a wind chime made of bones. Curiosity urged me closer. Inspecting it carefully revealed that several small animal bones were strung together with twine. As bizarre as it was, we assumed it must have been some primitive artwork left by previous campers. With no further leads to follow and daylight waning, we chose not to dwell on that grisly discovery. Later that evening, as shadows grew longer and darkness enveloped our surroundings, I lay inside my tent, listening to nature's nocturnal symphony that could rival any orchestra. Suddenly, amidst the harmonious sounds, I picked up on a faint rustling of leaves behind my tent. Unsettled, I peered out from under the canvas to investigate, but saw no sign of movement. After briefly discussing the situation with Eddie, who was still awake in his nearby tent, we concluded it had probably been an animal searching for food. Unconvinced but feeling slightly reassured, I drifted off to a troubled sleep. The next morning, we awakened to find our campground trashed, coolers overturned, supplies scattered, and deep gouges clawed into the tree trunks surrounding us. To our collective dismay, wildlife appeared to be completely disregarding park regulations on food storage. As Mike and Sarah started tidying up the mess, Eddie and I went in search of firewood for breakfast. That's when we found it. A bloody hiking boot that almost matched Sarah's shoe size lodged between the roots of a peculiarly gnarled tree stump. The tree itself bore shredded fragments of clothing and, more disturbingly, deep imprints that suggested someone had been struggling against whatever malevolent force entwined them with its branches. My blood ran cold as I recalled the bone wind chime, the sounds from last night, and those awful claw marks. Before we could investigate further or even fathom what creature might have caused such destruction, a guttural snarl echoed through the trees only meters away from us. Instinctively, Eddie and I grabbed what weaponry was at hand, a rusty hatchet and heavy walking stick respectively, but we never saw what approached us next. As shadows encroached upon us like tendrils from some primordial nightmare, we heard them move closer until they were right upon us. As the shadows closed in, a gigantic monstrous being emerged. It stood at least seven feet tall, covered in matted dark hair, and with elongated limbs that ended in sharpened, lethal claws. Eddie and I stared at this massive beast, our hearts pounding but without any screams escaping our lips. In an instant, it lunged at us with unexpected speed. We managed to dodge its first swipe, narrowly avoiding its deadly claws slicing through our chests. I swung my walking stick at its head, barely making contact as it nimbly dodged my pathetic attempt to defend myself. However, the connection seemed only to enrage it further. It charged at Eddie and ripped him apart with a single swipe. Horrified by what just happened to Eddie, I ran for my life, leaving my fallen weapon behind. Fear pulsed through my body as I scrambled over jagged rocks and fallen branches, desperately trying to create distance between myself and the beast. My lungs felt like they were on fire from the exertion, but stopping was not an option. I had one objective, to survive. As night turned into day and the sun began to rise, exhaustion forced me to rest behind a large boulder that would hopefully keep me hidden from my monstrous pursuer. During this tense respite, 
I couldn't help but curse the fact that we never bothered to bring our phones with us during this ill-fated vacation deep in the woods. Without them, there was no calling for backup or even looking up information regarding the creature that was after me. The haunting howls of the beast echoed through the trees, not too far from my hiding spot. It seemed like it was taunting me, daring me to come out of hiding, or perhaps just waiting for me to try. However, before I could decide on a course of action, something unexpected happened. Another strangled cry echoed through the woods, distinctly human. Forbidding myself to think about the possible consequences, I crept towards the sound. Carefully making my way through the dense foliage, I discovered a gruesome scene, a torn-apart tent, strewn with various camping gear and what looked like bits of human remains. The beast had apparently left its grisly mark there as well. Suddenly, seeing movement at the edge of my vision, I found a survivor, a fellow camper who appeared to be in shock. She clutched a photo of herself with her husband tightly in her hands, as something told me that he was no longer among the living. She introduced herself as Sarah and told me that she had caught a glimpse of the creature shortly before its attack. She mentioned its name, Grendel, something she had heard her husband mumble right before his untimely death. As we stayed low within the shadows, moving through our shared circumstances, it became harder for both of us to hide our suspicions that Grendel was looking for more prey, or perhaps seeking retribution for trespassing in its territory. Sarah and I continued to evade Grendel until we finally made it back to civilization, where we reported our harrowing experience to the authorities. Although I was well aware that most people would never believe such an outrageous story, I was relieved to see that Sarah and I received genuine concern from local residents. One elderly man living near a forest told us stories about an ancient legend connected directly to Grendel, claiming that several generations before us had encountered this terrifying creature. It seemed uncanny for Sarah and me both, but we held on to those stories with steadfast belief. The stirring questions surrounding Grendel haunted both of our nightmares for days to come as this unforgettable nightmare gradually settled into memory, muted by time but never erased from our minds. Even now, years later, on dark and silent nights, I cannot shake off the dread that grips me when I can't help but wonder whether Grendel is still out there, stalking through the trees, waiting for another unsuspecting traveler to chance across its murderous path. I'm a hunter. My name is Jedediah Kowalczyk, and I've spent most of my adult life stalking through the lush forests of Tennessee, engaging in an endless dance with wild animals. I'll never forget that fateful day deep in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, a place teeming with life and vibrant greenery. It started like any other hunting trip, and ended like something out of a horror movie. My hunting buddy, August Jedlicka and I embarked on our usual trek into the woods. We exchanged small talk and chuckled about how both our kids refused to eat vegetables to this day. We followed deer tracks that led us further off trail than usual, but confident in our navigational skills, we decided to pursue. As August manned his rifle, scanning for prey amidst the foliage, the forest began to feel colder. Suddenly a pungent odor assaulted our nostrils, like rotten eggs laced with copper. August glared at me with disbelief etched on his face, echoing my own thoughts. This stench didn't belong in the woods. We continued onward cautiously until we came upon the gut-wrenching source of the smell, a torn-apart campsite littered with scattered belongings and splatters of gore. A chill ran up my spine when I noticed deep claw marks etched into a nearby tree trunk. You ever seen anything like this before? asked August in hushed tones as he examined the scene. Never, I replied, tightening my grip on my rifle. The environment seemed malicious now. My every survival instinct screamed to turn back, but some perverse curiosity kept me rooted to the spot. Hours later we stumbled upon an enormous creature feasting on a mutilated deer carcass. The beast was unlike any animal we had ever encountered 
a monstrosity with razor-sharp claws and rows of vicious teeth protruding from its grotesque face. As the creature noticed our presence, it snarled in fury and charged at us with bloodlust. My hands shook as I panicked, raising my rifle to fire a few desperate shots. One bullet grazed its shoulder but did little more than enrage the beast further. It attacked relentlessly, swiping at August with reckless abandon. His terrified screams echoed through the trees while he flailed helplessly beneath the massive creature, unable to retaliate or call for help. Overcome with distress, witnessing my dear friend being mauled, and the realization that we were no match for this horrific entity, my instincts screamed to run before it claimed me next. I fired another round into the monster's side, a feeble attempt to buy time, then turned and sprinted deeper into the treacherous forest, heart pounding in my chest. But the terrifying sounds of pursuit never ceased, and I knew that monstrous beast was hot on my heels. Desperate to survive in a nightmare come to life, I scrambled over roots and ducked under low-hanging branches in a frantic game of cat and mouse. Sweat drenched my shirt as I attempted to maneuver through the dense forest, willing myself to keep up with the fleeing deer. The massive creature was still giving chase, and I knew that if it caught me, I would meet the same grisly end as my friend August. As I sprinted through the underbrush, I stumbled upon a clearing where several hunters had set up camp. They noticed the sheer terror painted across my face immediately and grabbed their weapons, ready to help me fight off whatever had sent fear coursing through my veins. My breaths came out in short gasps as I tried to warn them. Creature. August. Attacked. Was all I managed to stutter between my shallow breaths. Before we could react further, the monstrous beast emerged from the shadows its bloodlust evident by the gore-drenched talons that hung from its grotesque face. It snarled angrily at us, prompting the hunters to open fire at once. The creature roared in pain but didn't falter. If anything, our puny human weapons served only to fuel its rage further. With shocking speed and agility, it lunged onto its first victim within seconds before ripping him apart mercilessly. Panic overtook us all as we quickly realized that our rifles were no match for this entity. While every primal instinct screamed for survival, there was no option left but to run. Filled with desperation, I cried out, Split up! Go for help! Get anyone who can help us fight against this thing! We're not equipped nearly enough! And with those hurried words exchanged, we scattered in different directions like frightened birds in flight. The monstrous creature snarled in frustration, but chose one unlucky fellow as its second prey before continuing its relentless pursuit. The final cries of that hunter echoed through the trees while I ran as fast as my legs would carry me. Realizing how perilous this situation was, I decided to concoct a plan. I scavenged nearby materials and constructed a makeshift trap for the monstrous creature. The clock was ticking. I knew that the creature would not be far behind. Fortunately, my efforts to slow the creature down had bought me enough time to finish the trap. As the creature approached, I fled once more, leading it straight into my hastily constructed snare. The beast roared in fury as it fell right into my plan, becoming tangled and immobilized. With this brief opportunity of safety, I sprinted with renewed vigor in hopes of finding anyone else who could help me put an end to this nightmare. Soon enough, I stumbled upon a group of armed officials in the forest, who had been called in by some of the hunters who managed to escape from earlier encounters. They listened intently as I recounted the dreadful events and described the monstrous beast, though no one could determine its nature or origin. With haste and careful effort from all present, we devised a plan to eliminate the formidable creature that had claimed so many lives. Packed with superior firepower and teamwork on our side, we ventured back towards where I had trapped it earlier. Upon reaching the site of my crude snare, we found that the creature had broken free of its confinement, leaving traces of blood and destruction in its wake. Chills ran down my spine, but with a steely determination shared among us all, we continued our pursuit. The final confrontation erupted deep within the forest, the monstrous beast charged at use with every ounce of its unrelenting rage. 
It fought viciously to its last breath. Against our combined might and strategy, however, we prevailed at last, riddling its misshapen body with bullets until it couldn't stand any longer. Despite our victory over this unknown terror, we couldn't shake off the memory of those who lost their lives, August and the hunters who did nothing but attempt to protect those around them. We would carry the weight of their sacrifices with us so that their bravery would never be forgotten. As for the creature, its identity remained a mystery. But ultimately, in the wake of our harrowing victory, the uncertainty of what, or who, had spawned this monstrosity paled in significance, compared to the knowledge that we had somehow managed to defy such seemingly insurmountable odds. Whatever this beast was, we had faced it head-on and won. Tomorrow, we could live to fight another day. It was a fine evening in June 1997 when I joined my colleagues, Daniel and Marlene, for a bonfire in the Ozark Mountains. We chuckled about the locals' fear of something mysterious that stalked these woods. But as park rangers, we were far too practical for such nonsense. Little did I know that my life was about to change forever. Daniel was the first to notice it, his laughter fading into a puzzled expression as he stared off into the trees. You see that, Marlene? Over there by that rock. Something's not right, he muttered. Marlene and I squinted through the flickering firelight, trying to pinpoint what had caught his attention. A rustling sound broke the silence, and our eyes widened as we saw something scuttle away from us at an unnatural speed. I felt a cold sweat prickling my skin, but I forced myself to shake it off and go investigate what the mysterious creature could be. As we drew closer to where it had vanished, we found broken branches littering the ground and claw marks on tree trunks. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't friendly. Over the following days, more encounters were reported by hikers and campers. Clawed prints were discovered near camping sites, and wild animals were found mutilated in ways no known predator would cause. Unease settled over the Ozark Mountains like a fog that refused to lift. Marlene, who had always been sensitive to atmospheres, tried to keep everyone's spirits up with her famous bear sleeping bag jokes during our dinner break at the ranger station. However, even her impossible charm couldn't shake off our eerie experiences in those mountains. One day, while patrolling near a remote trailhead, Daniel heard whimpering emanating from behind some bushes. Following the sound with caution, he discovered a young woman curled up on the ground, covered in gashes and sobbing. She whispered about a monster with sharp claws and lightning speed, adding that its eyes glowed a sinister yellow. We helped her to the ranger station, where she received medical assistance before informing the local authorities about the strange occurrences. Despite our concerns about this faceless terror lurking in our beloved mountains, we remained focused on our job and tried our best to ignore the spine-chilling sensation that nipped at our subconsciousness. News began to spread further afield, and in an astounding turn of events, a world-renowned cryptozoologist named Dr. Eowyn Chalmers arrived to investigate. It was with a mix of excitement and dread that we guided him around the various areas where incidents had taken place. As we climbed over hills and made our way through dense forests, Dr. Chalmers regaled us with tales of wild creatures from folklore that supposedly had similar characteristics to what was terrorizing this region. While he spoke with an air of disbelief, it didn't take long for us all to become increasingly uncomfortable in the woods that were once comforting. Following one more particularly gruesome discovery, Dr. Chalmers decided that it would be wise to set up an overnight surveillance operation. He eagerly explained his complex system of motion-activated cameras aimed at capturing evidence of whatever was haunting these hills. Having reluctantly agreed to participate in this daring assignment, Marlene, Daniel, Dr. Chalmers, and I positioned ourselves in strategic locations around the camp as darkness fell upon us like a shroud. We sat in silence under the eerie moonlight, straining our senses for anything unusual. 
around midnight it happened. The air seemed charged with electricity as we heard branches snapping right near Daniel's station. Before any of us could react, out of the shadows emerged a tall figure wrapped in rags, emitting an earthy aroma. Its scales shimmered like countless blades in the moonlight, and my heart pounded against my chest as I realized the stranger in our midst was none other than the eerie, legendary figure of the Ozark Mountains we'd heard so much about. In that instant, my instincts took over, and I shouted for everyone to back away. The creature didn't hesitate. It lunged at Daniel, claws slashing through the air. He managed to dodge most of the strikes, but one caught his arm, drawing blood instantly. Dr. Chalmers scrambled to his backpack and pulled out a flare gun, firing it into the air in the hopes of scaring off the monster. To our luck, the flare seemed to disorient the creature, giving us a few moments to think. We decided against calling for help. The nearest town was miles away, and we knew they'd never make it in time. Instead, we pressed on with our surveillance mission. The creature recovered quickly and snarled viciously at us. Another flash of its claws ripped through Marlene's leg before she could crawl away. I couldn't bear to see my friends injured like this. I needed to do something. Pushing my fear aside, I grabbed a large branch from the forest floor and swung it at the creature with all my strength. To my astonishment, I landed a hit on its side, causing it to stumble back in pain. Or perhaps surprise? The beast wasn't down for long, though. It snarled again, viciously swinging back at me. My lucky strike had only enraged it more. As if from nowhere, Dr. Chalmers came charging at the monster once more, this time armed with a canister of bear mace from his backpack. He sprayed it directly into the eyes of our attacker. In response to this newfound agony, the creature roared, an unearthly wail that vibrated through our very bones and tore through trees as it retreated from us into the darkened woods. With heavy hearts and wounded bodies, we made our slow way back to town over several painstaking hours. Our grim arrival attracted attention right away. We confronted the local librarian, an elderly woman, with our bruised visages, desperately seeking information on what we'd just encountered. She hesitated, but eventually led us to a dusty, forgotten tome. It was there that I found what we sought. The monster's name was Rougarou, a sinister creature of French folklore believed to stalk the swamps and forests of North America. It was fast, vicious, and nigh-frighteningly intelligent. According to the stories, the villagers dreaded even speaking its name. As my friends received medical treatment in town, I couldn't help but feel a sick satisfaction knowing that we'd met and survived an encounter with this terrifying being of legend. Though life eventually returned to a semblance of normalcy in the Ozark Mountains, the tense atmosphere never quite left. Every rustle of leaves or distant howl on a moonlit night reminded me that the Rougarou still prowled those woods, waiting. It had tasted our fear and hungered for more. And yet, as time went on, our story inspired others to be vigilant instead of terrified. Some even began to fight back against this mythical terror that prowled their homes. But for now, the story remains incomplete. Somewhere out there in those darkened woods, the Rougarou watches and waits with bated breath, that slinking menace that haunts my sleepless nights. Will it ever truly be vanquished? Or shall it forever stalk this land in search of fresh prey? For now, it seems only time will tell. It all began in September 2016, when I moved to a secluded house just outside the town of Marstown, West Virginia. The serene location paired with an amazing view of the mountains was exactly what I needed after a bitter divorce. My once comfortable life had been ripped from me, and all I wanted was a fresh start. My new best friend during that time was a man named Ron Demetrius, who had lived in Marstown his entire life. He knew everyone and everything about the area. 
As a genuine fellow who cared about people, he made it his mission to make me feel welcome. We'd frequently share meals and chat together on my front porch, often losing track of time until well after sunset. One particular evening, as we sat in the fading light sipping on our drinks, Ron told me a story about an old abandoned mine nearby that had been closed for decades due to several unexplained accidents. The townsfolk whispered tales of terrible things surrounding it, strange accidents, mysterious disappearances, and odd sightings that seemed otherworldly. We've had several children go missing over the years, Ron said gravely. When it happens, everyone gets antsy and keeps their eyes peeled for any signs of those dreadful black-eyed kids. Black-eyed kids? I asked skeptically. Yeah, he replied. They're just like any other children except their eyes are completely black, no white part at all, like pits to oblivion. My curiosity piqued. I asked more about these strange, fearsome beings. Well, he continued with a heavy sigh, they only appear at night near the old mine and have this supernatural aura about them. They've been luring people there for years, but no one's ever caught one or even seen one with their own eyes and lived to tell the tale. At that moment, we were interrupted by the sound of a heavy thud coming from the back of the house. Ron grabbed a flashlight and I followed him as we investigated the source of the noise. After a quick examination, we discovered that a tree branch had fallen onto the roof, no doubt weakened by recent storms. With that mystery quickly resolved, we bid each other good night and returned to our respective homes. The conversation with Ron stuck in my mind for days. Each night, as I lay down to sleep in my new surroundings, I couldn't help but wonder about those black-eyed children. Deep down, I believed it was all just local folklore meant to keep people away from the mine. About two weeks later, after sunset on a rainy evening, I decided to take a drive and explore the area's back roads by myself. The weather was abysmal and visibility poor. It was difficult for me to see more than a few feet in front of the vehicle. After ten minutes of driving cautiously along an unfamiliar narrow trail, my headlights shone upon something up ahead. Two small figures with their backs turned to me stood huddled together in the rain. Slowly, I pulled alongside them and rolled down my window to offer assistance. They turned towards me eerily in sync, and my blood ran cold when I saw their eyes. Black as coal, hypnotic pools of nothingness. Could you give us a lift? The girl asked sweetly, trying to sound innocent. Our parents are waiting for us at the old mine. I knew in that instant they were those sinister children Ron had warned me about. Frantically rolling up my window and pressing down hard on the accelerator, I sped away from them as fast as possible. Their haunting faces were etched in my memory forever, as terror gripped me tightly. I drove away from the black-eyed children as fast as my car would allow, but fear had taken hold of me. I couldn't get there. Haunting faces out of my mind, their eyes, those soulless pools of blackness, seemed to envelop me, even though I was no longer in their presence. I knew I had to seek help, but who would believe me? The local sheriff might laugh at such a story and label me as just another person getting caught up in the town's mythology. Whatever these creatures were, they were genuinely dangerous. No tales or superstitions could change the fact that what I had encountered was real. It was getting late, and I needed to make a decision. Eventually, I decided to call my neighbor Ron. He had heard about these children before, and perhaps he would know what to do without involving law enforcement. Ron, I said trembling as my voice stuttered through the phone line. You're not going to believe what happened to me tonight. What is it? Ron replied with urgency. I encountered those black-eyed children you told me about. My voice cracked with fear. I could sense Ron's shock on the other end of the line. He hesitated before speaking. You need to come over right away. Arriving at Ron's house minutes later, I desperately recounted the events of that night. Ron listened intently, his face filled with concern. We have to warn others, he declared grimly. We moved quickly to assemble a meeting at the town hall for the following day. It wasn't easy convincing people that this gathering was of utmost importance, but our persistence paid off as townsfolk filled the seats, curious to hear what we had to share. As we stood in front of the congregation and presented our story on this menacing threat lurking just beyond their doors, we knew this was our only chance to convince them that these children were a genuine danger. At first, skepticism weighed heavily in the room, 
but as we provided more details on the black-eyed children, some people began to listen with interest. They asked questions about how to protect themselves and their families from these twisted beings. One gentleman revealed that his son had gone missing near the old mine several years earlier, and he now believed that his child may have been taken by these creatures. A somber realization descended upon the crowd as they acknowledged that these hot spots for black-eyed children's activity were the same areas where numerous people from their community had vanished without a trace. The townsfolk agreed that something had to be done to keep themselves and their families safe. They vowed to work together and watch out for one another, increasing security measures and organizing nightly patrols to help ensure everyone's safety. We managed to help make the community more aware of the danger lurking in the shadows. The once dismissed rumors were now taken seriously as a genuine threat that demanded action. Over time, more people came forward with tales of encounters with the black-eyed children, lending further credence to our story. Some mourned lost family members who had crossed paths with these dark beings or disappeared near the old mine. Although life in our town would never be quite the same, our inhabitants' unity in facing this unnerving menace was heartening. We managed to protect future generations from falling victim to the black-eyed children. In doing so, those dark entities ultimately failed in their sinister goal of spreading fear and chaos within our community. As time marched on, I never forgot my brush with those terrifying beings or the courageous individuals who joined us in safeguarding our home against them. Together, we survived an unimaginable horror but emerged as an even stronger and closer-knit community. It was a chilly October evening back in 2015 when my friends Dave, Jen, and I decided to embark on a camping trip in the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. We were looking forward to a weekend of relaxation, exploring, and bonding. I, for one, had been under a lot of stress from work, something I'm sure many can relate to. We set up camp near an old abandoned logging site deep in the heart of Monongahela National Forest. Despite the eeriness of the remote location, we were all eager to spend the weekend surrounded by nature. As nightfall arrived, we huddled around the campfire, sharing stories and making s'mores. We proceeded to talk about rumors of a twisted killer who supposedly inhabited these dark woods. The laughter gradually ceased as an unsettling silence began to sweep across our group. As I attended to the fire, something peculiar caught my attention. There, just outside our circle of light, was a bizarre arrangement of sticks and leaves, a failed attempt at a fire pit, or perhaps something entirely else. Little did we know that this seemingly innocent discovery would lead us to an unimaginable encounter with pure evil. The following morning, we embarked on a hike led by Dave through the endless trails surrounding our campsite. The forest enveloped us in its luscious green canopy, but as we ventured forward, drawn by curiosity, an overpowering scent of decay hovered in the air. We stumbled upon what appeared to be the remnants of an ancient symbol etched into the ground, roots entwined, horrifically unnatural. Suddenly from behind us came an intense snap. We whipped our heads around only for our eyes to land on nothing but empty space, giving us a sense of dread that slithered down each of our spines. Hey guys, Jen said nervously as she clutched her jacket tighter around her body. I really think we should get out of here. This place just doesn't feel right. Dave, unbothered by the ominous atmosphere, dismissed her concerns, eager to continue his exploration. So with tentative steps and glances over our shoulders, we marched forward with unease. As we delved deeper into the forest, the strange symbols grew in volume and detail, symbols that looked less like something left by an amateur prankster and more like the cryptic warnings of an ancient civilization. Eventually, we found ourselves standing before a dilapidated cabin nestled sickeningly among gnarled trees. What the hell is this place doing out here? I whispered while stepping toward the decaying structure. Without heeding our reservations or fear of the unknown antagonist tormenting us from afar, we entered what looked to be an abode of pure wickedness. 
The cabin's interior was dark and damp, with a pungent stench enveloping every corner. Glimmers of light flickered through the gaps in the decrepit walls, revealing a sinister collection of stained and dismembered doll parts strewn about. A guttural roar bellowed from deep within the cabin, an abomination in human form lunging at us from behind a rotting doorframe. Writhing tendrils wrapped around this horrific figure, supernatural in nature, that had been lying dormant amongst piles of ravaged remains. We sprinted through the woods, pursued relentlessly by this monstrosity that defied comprehension. Panic clawed at our every breath as our footfalls echoed endlessly deep within the sinister heart of the Appalachians. As the sun began to set on the third day, we found ourselves at a small mountain village where we hoped to find refuge from the relentless creature known as the Red-Eyed Ghoul. A local hunter named Jeb recognized the description of our pursuer and warned us that it was an infamous beast in these Appalachians, responsible for numerous deaths and disappearances. He recounted the origin of this monster. It was once a man who had been wronged by his own kind, causing him to seek out dark rituals that turned him into the red-eyed ghoul. Now fueled by rage and hatred, he lurked in these woods, preying on those who trespassed on his territory. Jeb believed some old spells or charms could help us ward off the ghoul, but couldn't pinpoint where to find them. Feeling desperate and exhausted, my companions and I split into groups to search for anything that could serve as protection against this abomination. Time was running out as darkness crept over the dense forest. I was paired with Emily, a brave young woman whom I had met since this nightmare began. As we scanned each cabin for any sign of magical artifacts or information, we shared stories and bonded over our common goal of survival. Just as twilight turned into night, Emily unearthed a worn journal hidden beneath a pile of dusty books in one of the dilapidated cabins. As we flipped through its pages, barely legible texts revealed long-forgotten incantations that could provide us with temporary immunity against the ghoul's influence. With newfound hope surfacing within us, we frantically memorized the chants before rejoining our fellow survivors. Together, under Jeb's guidance, we recited these spells and felt a spark of unwavering determination within us all. Armed with our newfound knowledge and resilience, we left the village with caution but no longer in fear. Hiking through unforgiving terrain, we knew the red-eyed ghoul would not be far behind us. However, we had changed from being hapless victims to well-prepared adversaries. As dawn broke, we reached an open field, deciding it would be perfect for a final confrontation. With grim expressions, we formed a defensive circle and began chanting the spell again and again. Moments passed in utter silence until the creature suddenly emerged from the trees. It was more horrifying than our imaginations could conceive. Humanoid but grotesque in every aspect, its putrid flesh hung from its bones and its glaring red eyes burned with rage. Feeling a pulse of energy surge through us, we held our breaths and stood our ground as the ghoul charged towards us. To our relief, as it got closer and closer, the creature seemed to stagger and retreat. The spells were working. But as victory seemed within grasp, a shrill screech echoed throughout the field, leaving us disoriented and vulnerable. In that moment of chaos, the ghoul lunged at Emily. Desperate to save her, I threw myself in front of her just as she screamed one last incantation. We felt an unseen force crackle like electricity before it smashed into the red-eyed ghoul. It wailed in pain as it withered away before finally disappearing into a thick cloud of dark mist. We looked around at our surroundings, broken but alive, both thankful to have survived and realizing that together we had banished this darkness, if only temporarily. Though we lost some friends during this harrowing experience, those that survived formed an unbreakable bond, vowing to never forget what transpired in those sinister forests of the Appalachians. United in strength and hope, we left that place behind us, knowing that even though the red-eyed ghoul was not genuinely vanquished forever, it would think twice before crossing paths with us again.
but as we departed, I could not help but glance back one last time, only to see a pair of blood-red eyes lurking in the shadows. Even though we had managed to escape, it was apparent the red-eyed ghoul would continue to haunt these woods for years to come. This happened to me about a decade ago. I was visiting my cousin Silas in Weston, West Virginia. We were chatting over coffee on his front porch, surrounded by the still and silent Appalachian Mountains. Our conversation drifted with time, the soft murmur of our words mingling with birdsong. A local missing persons case caught our attention as Silas recounted a conversation he'd had at the grocery store earlier that day. A hiker named Branson had gone missing in the dense wilderness that stretched out before us. The search had grown increasingly morose with each passing day. The next day, curiosity peaked. We decided to take a hike in that same vicinity. Armed only with water bottles and a camera, we set off from the trailhead. For hours, we followed the gently twisting path up the mountainside. As we hiked, our conversation turned to local legends and rumors. Silas told me about a group of cannibalistic mountain men that were said to lurk in these woods, but I dismissed it as rural folklore meant to frighten children. We paused for lunch beside a babbling stream and noticed something unusual, peculiar markings carved into tree trunks nearby. Suddenly we heard a snap from behind us. As we both whipped around, I caught sight of a tall figure out of the corner of my eye, but the moment was fleeting. As fear gripped us in its icy claws and curiosity gave way to dread, Silas couldn't help but wonder if there was any truth to those legends after all. I never gave the stories much thought, he admitted, glancing around nervously. But seeing those carvings has my mind reeling. I nodded solemnly, though I still doubted whether there was any connection between old fables and this uneasy predicament. We chose not to call for help because cell service was non-existent here in the dense Appalachian wilderness, and we didn't want to risk drawing even more attention to ourselves. There was still a chance it could have been a simple coincidence, just another hiker or hunter passing by. We pressed onward, keen to put distance between ourselves and that eerie experience. Yet something shifted in our surroundings. The air grew thick with tension, like unseen eyes watched our every move. Silas tried distracting us with a lame joke, but our laughter fell short, tinged with nervous energy. So we continued in relative silence. Suddenly, Silas stopped dead in his tracks, whispering through clenched teeth. Look at that. A mutilated body lay ahead of us on the trail. It was Branson, his face distorted in a horrifying mask of pain and terror. Our shock gripped us tighter as initial panic threatened to take hold. How could this happen? We examined the body from a safe distance and then decided we needed to report this grim discovery to the authorities so they would know the search was over for all the wrong reasons. Silas lowered his voice. Do you think those mountain men are responsible for this? I'm not sure, I replied hesitantly. We hid behind some trees as we heard ominous footsteps approaching. Whoever it was moved clumsily through the bushes, branches snapping beneath their weight. As fear threatened to betray our hiding spot with increasingly labored breaths, we stole fleeting glances at whoever stalked so close by, a group of massive men bearing crudely constructed weapons like they had stepped straight out of a nightmare. Our hearts raced against time as dread constricted our lungs like a vice. I whispered to Silas, Go back to town and report this now. I'll keep an eye on them and follow them if I can, but stay undetected as much as possible. As Silas turned and slipped away down the mountain, I steeled my nerves and focused on tracking the cannibalistic mountain men. From behind some underbrush, I watched them descend on the fallen body of Branson with a preternatural hunger. I did as I had promised Silas and followed the mountain men from a safe distance. Their ravenous feasting on poor Branson's remains was an image I would never be able to erase from my memory. They were large, brute-like creatures covered in filth and grime from their apparent life in these harsh mountains. Their faces were unkempt, with wild beards that hid their twisted expressions. Their eyes seemed devoid of any compassion or humanity. Despite my overwhelming fear, I found myself determined to prevent these monsters from causing further harm. Stealthily tracking the mountain men, I traced their steps back to their rudimentary encampment, 
hidden deep within the dense forests of the mountains. Through sheer force of will, I made the decision not to call for help immediately, opting instead to remain hidden in the trees and observe the group's erratic movements. I rationalized that alerting authorities prematurely could put innocent lives at risk if they walked straight into this den of savagery. The campsite resembled a crude butchery, save for any sanitary standards that one would expect in such an establishment. At first, it was difficult to discern what exactly was being butchered amongst the chaos, until the group dragged in yet another lifeless body. A whimper caught in my throat as I recognized it as another missing hiker. The sun had already begun to dip below the horizon when Silas returned with several armed park rangers. As quietly as possible, we updated them on what we had witnessed so far. They listened intently and formulated a plan. Under cover of darkness and guided by my earlier reconnaissance, our small party approached the cannibalistic mountain men's campsite once again. As we neared, my heart pounded wildly against my ribcage, unsure whether our plan would work. As we watched from our hiding places amongst the trees, one of the rangers triggered a flare gun, which exploded in a brilliant flash of light over the campsite. The sudden illumination caused the mountain men to shriek and howl as they attempted to shield their eyes from the blinding starburst. Seizing the opportunity, the rangers charged forward with their rifles ready. The rapid, well-aimed assault caught the mountain men completely off balance and terrified, leaving them no choice but to surrender. My breath finally steadied once I saw the macabre troop taken into custody. In a flash, it was all over. The months-long nightmare we had endured had come to an abrupt end. As we started to recover from the ordeal, we took a moment to remember those who had not survived, Branson, fellow hiker, and friend. The story of our harrowing encounter with these monsters would go on to shock casual observers and seasoned investigators alike. Many found it hard to comprehend that human beings could be capable of such acts of barbarity. In the weeks that followed, there were countless autopsies conducted on those who had perished in those mountains, painting an unthinkably gruesome picture about the mountain men's savage rituals. Families grieved for their loved ones, yet there was also a newfound sense of relief within our once quiet town, knowing that these murderous cannibals would now face justice for their abhorrent deeds. Despite our shared trauma and heavy hearts, Silas and I knew we had done what was necessary to bring closure to our tortured community. This terrible chapter of our lives was finally over, but it was a burden that we would bear for as long as we lived. As I later reflected on my near brush with death, I couldn't shake one chilling thought. If their bloodlust hadn't spared me that day by some twist of fate, I too could have fallen prey to the cannibalistic mountain men's grisly banquet. But now... With them no longer roaming freely in the mountains, their murderous reign had come to a definitive close. Our community would grieve, heal, and eventually move forward, but we would never forget those we lost in the process. I walked into the small diner in Cochiti Pueblo, New Mexico, feeling the weight of another difficult day at work. My name is Lucas Sosi, and I'm a local ranger around these parts. As the only Native American among my colleagues, I take pride in keeping our land safe and clean. Our usual table? Asked my best friend Peter Ulibari with a warm smile. Yeah, I nodded, sharing a first-hand account of how someone had vandalized the ancient petroglyphs. They asked me to lead an investigation to help catch those responsible. Peter listened intently and sympathized. As our conversation continued... An old man by the corner caught my attention. He had sandy gray hair that grew long down his back, a worn leather jacket, and eyes, like he had seen something terrifying. He lived alone, and people knew little about Roy Gutierrez. He had never married, nor had any children. His expression turned stern as he approached us. Luca, he whispered, glancing nervously around him. I need your help. Concerned by Roy's appearance and demeanor, I agreed to follow him outside to hear him out. We ventured into the chilly night air and wrapped our coats tighter around ourselves. Just past sundown earlier this week, he began trembling with fear as he spoke. My dog, Mingus. She ran away while on a walk around the reservation woods. I could see his struggle to continue, as if what happened next was crushing him. I heard her bark ferociously before, 
before all went silent. The words escaped Roy in quivering spurts. When I finally found her, all that was left were pieces, strewn about, teeth marks. What could do that? I asked softly, bracing myself for the answer. Roy responded with his voice barely above a whisper. It wasn't an animal we know. It had large, piercing green eyes, almost human-like. It was massive, like a monster. He cautiously looked side to side before taking out an old photo from his wallet. He pointed at the creature that resembled a large wolf, but ferociously mutated. I saw this brute last night, lurking in the shadows. The same beast killed my Mingus, I'm sure of it. Overwhelmed by everything Roy had just revealed, I promised to help find whatever it was responsible for the gruesome death of his dog. Just as we finished talking, distressing news broke out. Two murmurs had taken place near the reservation woods. One victim had been Denise Valdez, Roy's niece. Aye, Denise! Roy sobbed upon hearing the name, swiftly making a solemn decision those responsible for vandalizing sacred symbols would have to wait. Justice was needed in response to more pressing horrors. Searching for clues to trace back to the unknown creature and these brutal attacks begins with discussing with Peter. He tells me he will follow me on this ordeal. Together, along with Roy at the lead, we ventured into our target area, the reservation woods. As we began our descent into the reservation woods, the atmosphere was tense. Each of us knew the risk we were taking, searching for this deadly creature. However, our determination to find it was only fueled by the news of Denise's death. Roy led the way, his determination evident in his gait. Hours passed as we trekked deeper into the woods, following any signs that could lead us to this mysterious creature's hideout. Finally, we came across a cave entrance concealed by vegetation. Nervously we approached. The smell emanating from within immediately hit me, a pungent odor suggesting decay and death. We hesitated at the entrance, none of us willing to venture inside first. I suggested that we call for help as this might be too dangerous for just us to handle. Roy argued that by the time help arrived, the creature might be gone and it would bring even more bloodshed. Peter agreed with him, and with no other alternatives, we continued cautiously into the cave. The darkness inside was suffocating, so we relied on our flashlights to illuminate our surroundings. Inching forward, our senses were consumed by fear as we navigated this descent into madness. A sudden noise from behind caught our attention, and we turned sharply to see something darting swiftly through the dark shadows of the cave's opening. Blood smeared on its fur guided our eyes towards its face, those piercing green eyes locked onto ours. The massive beast resembled a wolf, but with grotesque mutations, elongated limbs and distorted features, unlike anything I had ever seen. Before any of us could react or process what we were witnessing, it struck suddenly and brutally. Peter barely got out a scream before he went down, suffering multiple deep gashes from its sharp claws across his body. Unsure of what to do next, and driven purely by instincts, Roy pulled me back towards the entrance of the cave while the creature mauled Peter. We didn't have time to help him or even think about fighting back. Our new priority was escaping with our lives. As we stumbled back out of the cave, I saw out of the corner of my eye a second beast emerging from the darkness. It stared at us, deciding whether to pursue or let us flee. Roy must have noticed as well and grabbed a branch on the way out, setting it ablaze with his lighter to deter any pursuit. We ran as fast as our legs would carry us, terrified of what might be behind us. The entire trek back was filled with panic-induced thoughts and suppressed sobs given everything that had happened that night. When we finally made it to the safety of our homes, adrenaline gave way to exhaustion and reality began setting in. Peter's lifeless body would never leave those woods. Determined to make sure no one else fell victim to those monstrous creatures, we decided it was time to alert law enforcement. They conducted their investigation, but found no trace of any such beast. The lack of evidence frustrated us and left us questioning whether they believed our story at all. The officials deemed Peter's death a freak animal attack, but deep down, we knew better. As the days went by without incident, we attempted returning to our daily lives while honoring Peter's memory in our hearts. At least now, people knew the dangers lurking in those woods. The creature forever remains unexplained as a part of this gruesome tale. What it truly is remains a well-guarded secret within the depths of those dark woods. 
All I am left with are memories of innocent lives lost and questions endless in my mind. What spawned such creatures? Are there more out there? Will one day their true nature be revealed? For now, though, life goes on, and we face each new day with caution, knowing that somewhere close by lies a terror beyond anything we can understand or explain. This happened to me six years ago, while traveling through the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. I had always enjoyed hiking, so I thought nothing of exploring a remote trail during my weekend getaway. My name is Daniel Seaver, a 33-year-old mechanic from Pittsburgh. The town at the base of the mountain had only a few hundred residents, all of whom seemed to know each other. I met two other hikers in town, Maya and Sam, a married couple originally from Maine. We agreed to venture out into the wilderness together. The first day of our hike was uneventful. We shared stories about our lives. Maya was a nurse, and Sam was an electrician. We laughed together about our common frustrations and listened attentively when one of us shared something more personal. It wasn't until the second day that we stumbled upon something strange. An empty campsite lay abandoned, belongings scattered around as if someone had left in a hurry, or worse, been dragged away. Concerned, we decided to stick closer together and became more cautious as we continued hiking. When night fell, we gathered around a fire for warmth and comfort. The full darkness enveloped us as an unsettling quiet settled around our camp. Maya spoke up first, stating how weird it felt to be surrounded by these silent woods. Sam agreed, unease painting his features. A sudden gunshot pierced through the silent night air like a thunderclap, jolting us from our quiet moment. Panic set in as we scrambled for cover, hiding behind nearby trees and bushes for safety. Before my eyes could adjust to the darkness, I saw a hulking figure emerging from the shadows, heavily built and donning ragged clothes stained with what appeared to be blood. The figure held a rifle and scanned the area intently, but said nothing. Fear pulsed through me as I clutched my small pocket knife tightly. I knew I had seen a monster. This being was certainly no ordinary man and its viciousness was palpable in the moonlight as it stalked the surrounding forest. While Maya, Sam, and I managed to avoid detection for the moment, we knew that we couldn't hide forever. With tense whispers, we agreed to swiftly move through the forest, hoping to outrun whatever menace hunted us. We knew that splitting up would be dangerous, so we clung to each other as we plunged into the darkness. As we moved silently through the dense woods, I couldn't help but frantically look over my shoulder, Convinced that at any moment I would see this monstrous figure charging towards us with the hunger of a ruthless predator. We heard the distant sound of shots occasionally ringing out, an unsettling reminder of our impending doom. However, our luck seemed to have run out when Sam let out a pained grunt after stepping on a sharp rock. His yell echoed beyond the trees, surely catching the attention of our relentless pursuer. My heart raced as I sensed danger close by. We didn't have time to tend to Sam's wound. He bit his lip hard and hobbled alongside us as we hurried along, desperately seeking a way out. The looming threat spurred us on, adrenaline replacing fatigue in our battered bodies. In the distance, we spotted what looked like an old building partially hidden amongst the trees, a possible refuge for us to hide in and regroup. Out of options and exhausted beyond measure, we decided to make a break for it. As we began our final sprint towards safety, I couldn't suppress a feeling deep in my gut that something about this situation was disturbingly familiar. As the old building grew closer, we noticed its decayed walls and broken windows. The place seemed abandoned, and though it wasn't an ideal hiding spot, we couldn't be choosy. As I helped Sam limp towards it, I couldn't shake the familiar feeling that haunted me since we started running. I pushed open the creaky door grimacing as it made a loud noise that could easily alert the mountain men following us. We entered cautiously and found ourselves in a room filled with debris and remnants of furniture. Carefully, we moved deeper into the building, feeling for hidden dangers in the dark. That's when they came, the mountain men. They were tall and burly figures with long, disheveled hair and tattered clothes, carrying weapons as brutal as their appearance. A multitude of scars decorated their rugged faces testifying to the life of violence they led. 
Those men had no trace of humanity left in them, searching only to satisfy their insatiable hunger for human flesh. Sam let out a quiet groan as they entered the room. He collapsed onto the floor from exhaustion and pain. The thud he made caught their attention instantly. My heart sank for a moment, before instincts kicked in. There was nothing else to do but run. As I sprinted through the crumbling building with every ounce of energy left in me, their guttural growls echoed through the corridors, closing in relentlessly. Sam's injury made it impossible for him to stand up and battle against his imminent fate. Just as I thought all was lost, a ray of hope appeared in the form of a narrow window leading outside. Without a second thought, I leaped out head first into the cold night air. Seconds later, crashing sounds ensued behind me. These cannibalistic mountain men had one goal in mind, catching their prey no matter what it takes. As I made my descent towards some bushes below, I glimpsed one of them coming to the window to pursue me. Fortune favored me when I realized they struggled to fit through the small gap. This gave me precious moments to get away and find help before they figured a way out. I knew that Sam and I couldn't do this alone. We needed help. It was near impossible to call anyone in this remote area, as signal strength was scarce, but I had to try. With hands shaking from fear and exertion, I pulled my phone from my pocket and dialed the emergency number. As it rang, I kept moving, refusing to stop in fear of being caught. Miraculously, someone picked up on the other end. Barely able to catch my breath, I relayed our situation as quickly as possible. While waiting for their arrival, I hid behind some dense foliage just away from the building, lying low. The mountain men eventually exited the structure after finding an alternative route. They sniffed the air, feral eyes scanning around for any signs of prey. My heart pounded violently, but I didn't dare move. Hours later, sirens pierced the silence like a beacon of hope cutting through the darkness of despair. As law enforcement officers approached cautiously, weapons drawn, they found Sam miraculously still alive, grievously injured yet clinging on to life with every ounce of strength he had. The mountain men scattered into the depths of the forest as if they dissolved into the shadows themselves. Their monstrous figures vanished while the officers attended to Sam's injuries and called for backup. Though none of us could have anticipated those terrifying events, we lived to see another day, all because of courage and determination in those moments where it mattered most. As days passed into weeks, my mind often wandered back to that harrowing night when we scrambled for survival against bloodthirsty fiends masquerading as human beings themselves. Authorities continued their search and investigation regarding the cannibalistic mountain men. In the aftermath, a veil of bitter reminders slipped over our lives like an invisible shadow. Memories of that dreadful encounter haunted us in different ways. Sam's wounds healed, but left gruesome scars as a constant reminder of the night. Whereas my psyche bore the marks of a familiar darkness, I couldn't quite place. Regardless, we prevailed and emerged from this nightmare as changed people who will never forget how close we came to death's door that fateful night, or the whispered prayers for rescue we held so dearly in our hearts. I stepped onto the creaky porch of my newly rented cabin, nestled deep in the woods of Oregon near Crater Lake National Park. Escaping city life, I, Timothy O'Shaughnessy, craved solitude and nature's beauty. I didn't think about how wild nocturnal creatures startle you with their eerie cries. Good day to be alive, I murmured with a smile as I unloaded my truck. My phone buzzed. My longtime friend from college, Rowena Fitzhugh called for an impromptu visit. How could I say no? That evening, joined by her husband, Maximilian, we caught up on life. Later that night, miles away from any urban setting under a myriad of stars, we shared laughs and old stories over campfire stew. Suddenly, screams pierced the calm air. We froze, eyes wide in shock and disbelief. The screams deepened into guttural wails of distress. Panicked people dashed through the trees in our direction. Blood stained their clothes as they pressed fingers to open wounds. We have to call for help, Rowena exclaimed. No cell signal, Maximilian pointed out. 
gripping his wounded arm to stop its bleeding. We decided to split up. Some would try to reach authorities. Maximilian would stay behind with the injured while I scanned for potential threats nearby. Exploring deeper into the woods, I stumbled upon a hideous sight. A person sprawled on the ground among mangled foliage and twisted limbs. Blood pooled around torn flesh and broken bones. Organs dragged across dirt. A trail of chaos painted grotesquely before my eyes. I forced myself not to vomit while clutching tightly at the revolver tucked into my belt. Emerging from woodland shadows was a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen, an amalgamation of human features and some terrible primal beast. Its gnarled hands dripped blood down its muscular arms, its skin an ashen gray suffused with evil intent. Despite my fear, I cracked a nervous joke to myself. Well, is it human or not? Make up your mind. My adrenaline surged, every sense heightened. I steadied my revolver in shaking hands, knowing that if I missed, the beast would surely slaughter me in an instant. The dust beneath my feet betrayed my position as I took a hasty step back. The creature locked eyes on me, and those dark orbs revealed unfathomable terror and malevolence. The twisted reflections of the people it hurt, or possibly killed. I forced out a half-hearted chuckle before blabbering a weak attempt at humor. You ever been to Oregon? They have great parks, assuming you don't get attacked by wild monsters. The creature remained unperturbed by my cheap jokes as it slowly circled me. I could see every rippling muscle tense and bulge beneath its grayish skin while it coiled itself for a deadly attack. The creature lunged at me with a guttural growl, its claws gleaming in the moonlight. I raised my revolver and fired, but the shot went wide. At this distance, I didn't have much chance of hitting it, but at least the noise seemed to throw it off balance for a moment. In that brief respite, I considered yelling for help, but realized quickly that out here in the woods, miles from the nearest town, there was no one nearby to hear my cries. I glanced around for anything I could use as a weapon. A rock or a branch might buy me enough time to escape to safety but found nothing nearby. As the creature regained its footing and bared its teeth, I knew my only chance to survive lay in running away from this forsaken woodland. Ignoring my exhaustion, I dashed towards the tree line, desperately trying to put distance between myself and the abomination. It didn't take long for the creature to give chase. My heart hammered in my chest as I sprinted through the woods branches scratching against my skin and ripping holes into my clothes as they caught on tree limbs. As we hurled through the darkness of the forest at breakneck speeds, trees whipped past us like spectral apparitions. The relentless pursuit of this nightmarish monster filled each passing moment with terror. Any hope of rescue dwindled with every footfall. From behind me came a sickening crunch, followed by howls of pain and anger from my pursuer. The thought that maybe it had been injured spurred me on even more, further fueling my desperate flight. My pace slackened as fatigue started pulling me down into its grip. Still hearing sharp thuds slicing through shrubbery in close pursuit, yet catching fainter howls of agony fueled mixed feelings. Dread versus hope. Then suddenly quietude enveloped the surroundings. I continued moving but cautiously dialed back my steps into a light jog. Without a warning, the creature's screech tore through the air again, ricocheting like a mad banshee through the hallowed canopy. With adrenaline flooding my veins, I mustered all remaining strength into reaching for safety. Nearing the edge of woods, the creature receded into darkness as if the shadows reclaimed it. But I dared not let hope gain a rightful footing in my heart, lest despair crush it with cold hands. Who knew how many others had fallen prey to this abhorrent nightmare? Had those unfortunate souls been vacationers as well? Perhaps looking for peace and escape from city life, only to find themselves trapped within jaws of such monstrous evil. Finally, breaking through the boundary of trees, moonlight revealed a small, isolated diner ahead. The smudged window shone like a beacon of hope in the dark night. 
a refuge from the terror that relentlessly quested to end my existence without remorse. I burst through the diner doors, panting frantically, its patrons casting startled gazes at my disheveled appearance. I slumped on the floor and caught my breath while they hurriedly conversed amongst themselves about what to do with someone who stank of death and barely clung on to life. Hours later, as dawn broke through foliage and basked sleepy town awake, they gathered around me recounting their close encounters or tales of vanished townsfolk that never returned from an evening walk hauntingly similar to mine. Though I had no rational explanation for what had transpired within forest depths, we could only guess at vile creatures' origins. Possibly an experiment gone wrong, or natural aberration no scientist would believe existed outside horror films or storybooks. The sun cast its warm rays over me as I sat there surrounded by kind-hearted strangers who heard my tale with sad sympathy, those very same souls where death had left its gruesome calling card. My ordeal was finally over, but the horrors of that fateful night would linger on for as long as I lived. I had barely escaped with my life, and the memory of those mutilated bodies left in gruesome wakes by the creature's rampage weighed heavily upon me. Though grateful for surviving and the kindness of strangers, I could only lament the terrible cost paid by others who had crossed paths with this fiendish adversary. I'm Mark Fenton a small-town detective working in Petersville, Kentucky. My life revolves around investigations and uncovering the truth. It was another day solving disputes when I received a call about a mysterious case involving missing persons. At the scene, I met Officer Brown who briefed me on the bizarre situation. The residents of an old house had disappeared without warning. Neighbors heard screams but assumed it was just kids playing aggressive games. Guess we were wrong, one of them said remorsefully. The house looked ordinary from the outside but seemed empty and lifeless as we stepped into the mess of broken furniture and scattered belongings. This is so unlike them, stated Walter Lindell, a neighbor who'd known the family for years. The investigation continued, and as we moved further into the house, we discovered a narrow passage that led to the basement. The wooden stairs creaked under our weight, making every step feel uncertain. The concrete floor below looked ravaged as if a wild animal had clawed at it in frustration. I found something surprising when I examined dried bloodstains and unknown hair samples in the corner, something not human-like but also not like any animal I'd seen before. We couldn't find any trace of the missing family, no clothes, passports, or valuables. As night fell, we regrouped outside to discuss our finding with locals. The decrepit old man muttered about an ancient legend, how generations ago, Petersville suffered unusual casualties because of a wolfman, a monstrous creature that haunted their lives. The villagers had eventually forced it to retreat deep into the woods, or so they believed. Everyone listened with skepticism, yet felt an uneasy chill in their bones. As days turned into weeks and more, locals vanished without clues. Desperation filled Petersville air. Chatter amongst townspeople gravitated towards this otherworldly presence that could only be seen as shadows in the night. Witness accounts describe it a tall, wolf-like creature with a muscular human-like body. Sinister glowing eyes seemed to pierce through the darkness, stalking and hunting its prey. Everyone was terrified. Even those who didn't believe in the supernatural couldn't shake their fear of this unknown enemy. Detective Lewis, a recently retired colleague and friend, approached me as I reviewed the evidence. I remember working on a case before you joined us, he began. It was eerily similar, but we never got to it as the disappearances stopped all of a sudden. We decided to explore Lewis's old case files for possible connections and quickly realized that we were dealing with something much bigger than we initially thought. Meanwhile, uncertainty and dread continued to spread through Petersville like wildfire, spurring police and town volunteers to patrol at night, hoping to capture or kill this elusive predator. One Sunday evening as I investigated further into the woods near the house of missing family, 
I stumbled upon a hidden and long-abandoned warehouse deep within the secluded forest area. This felt like a place where evil thrived. As I slowly entered the warehouse, the moonlight revealed gruesome and horrifying scenes of human remains, an assembly line of pain and torment. It appeared as though this creature meticulously recorded its acts, each victim unique from others. Suddenly, I heard rustling and held my breath as I saw it, the humanoid wolf creature standing before me. Its spine-chilling gaze sent waves of terror through my veins. In that moment, I understood the gravity of our situation, an unsuspecting small town haunted by an otherworldly harbinger of death. I hesitated, knowing that calling for help would only attract the creature's attention to others, putting more lives at risk. The humanoid wolf-like figure towered over me, its fur matted with gore and dirt. Its snout was twisted into a menacing snarl, bearing its razor-sharp teeth dripping with blood. The creature's deep-set eyes bored into me, reflecting a bestial malice fueled by pure instinct. The realization that the townsfolk of Petersville suspected the existence of a werewolf came flooding back. They hadn't called it by that name, but the many grisly descriptions matched this monstrous fiend now standing in front of me. I had dismissed their claims as mere folklore and paranoia. Now, I understood my grave mistake. Detective Lewis had gone to inspect another part of the woods that evening while keeping in touch with walkie-talkies. Clawing through my panic-fueled paralysis, I frantically tried to reach him. Lewis, it's the warehouse. I found it. The creature. It's... Before I could finish the sentence, the monstrosity lunged towards me with lightning speed and immense strength. I barely dodged its attack and scrambled desperately away from it. But there was no escape. With each frenzied leap and desperate sprint further into the dark woods, I could feel its presence closing in on me like an unstoppable avalanche of fur and fangs. Blood pounded in my ears as fear consumed every thought. Suddenly, I heard Lewis's voice crackling through the walkie-talkie on my belt. Hang on! Almost there! Seconds later, a deafening shot pierced the night air as Detective Lewis appeared from behind trees with his trusty hunting rifle. The creature staggered from the forceful impact, but did not fall. It wheeled around to face its new enemy, but didn't attack, instead keeping careful distance, wounded and snarling. Lewis continued to fire, unleashing a hail of bullets on the beast. Though injured, the monster still managed to tear through our surroundings in its wrath, making escape difficult. Finally, with a guttural growl and one final look of hatred in our direction, the creature retreated into the darkness. We both stood there panting, adrenaline fueling us for further action if needed. But the night was silent, and in that instant, we knew it was gone, at least for now. The twisted wreckage of the warehouse lay bare behind us like a mockery of our futile attempts at understanding what we faced. Weeks later, although no further sightings or attacks by the creature occurred, Petersville continued to live in fear. The warehouse and its gruesome contents had been discovered by police shortly after our encounter. They surmised that it was a lair of sorts for this insidious predator. We could never forget those who suffered at its hands, innocent victims simply caught in its path of terror as it roamed through their town and eliminated them one by one. Their memory haunted us as we went about our lives, always watchful and armed for any sign of the monster's return. Ultimately, life in Petersville returned to relative calm over time. But the true horror of it all, that a werewolf-like creature was living among us, became like an open wound that refused to heal entirely within me and Lewis. We could not comprehend or accept that such an abomination could exist. We were left considering that perhaps there truly were some things that could not be explained or rationalized. Creatures and beings beyond our understanding, dwelling quietly in the shadows of human existence. The memory of my own brush with death often resurfaces in my mind like a vengeful specter clawing at my sanity. I would look back on that fateful Sunday evening when I encountered a deadly and unnatural foe as the moment my life irrevocably changed. The warehouse in the woods became not only a monument to the fallen, 
but also a stark reminder that some evils lay hidden in plain sight, waiting for the chance to strike again. As I lay in bed each night, listening to the distant howling wind echoing through the trees and streets of Petersville, I am constantly plagued by one chilling question. What if it returns? I'm Grant Thompson, and I work as a park ranger in Yellowstone National Park. My wife and I recently separated, so I find solace in the wilderness. Strolling through the dense forest, I enjoy the crunch of fallen leaves beneath my feet. An elk drinks calmly from a nearby stream. One day, while making my rounds, I hear a faint cry for help in the distance. It's muffled and strained, but I'm trained to help people in distress. Hurrying toward the sound, I find a disoriented tourist named Felicity Staver, claiming she woke up in a hidden cave near here after being kidnapped. Felicity believes a creature had dragged her away while she was walking alone. She's hesitant to share this information out of fear of sounding foolish. However, following her lead to an isolated cave concealed by dense foliage reveals unusual claw marks on trees and an overwhelming stench of decay lingering. As we approach the cave, Felicity notices a pair of hikers she knows, Jonah DeMarco and Sasha Levidos, both looking equally unnerved as they share their stories of mysterious disappearances nearby. The incident seems unbelievable to me due to its improbability. Still, their details and unsettling demeanor suggest there's something worth investigating further. My radio is dead. Even though this park has spotty reception at best, it's unusual that we have no signal at all. We can't call for help. Conversing among ourselves, we agree to cautiously explore this cave for more answers, especially due to recent strings of missing persons with no leads discovered yet. As we descend deeper into darkness, our flashlights uncover ripped clothing and random personal belongings peppered along damp walls. We come upon another cave dweller named Innes Cromwell captive inside. When released from his barely lit prison, he joins our uneasy collective venture through uncharted territory. Our surroundings become increasingly unsettling as we progress, eerie howls echoing in the distance, claw marks on the cave walls intensifying in frequency. Our nervousness escalates without restraint. One by one, people make jokes to lighten the mood, but that nervous laughter barely covers the unnerving chills running down our spines. It's almost as if our misplaced humor accelerates an unseen force hulking near us. Venturing further into the complex network of tunnels, we stumble across gruesome scenes of inexplicable violence, bloodstains splattering deep recesses with human body parts littering the cavern floor. As a park ranger, my training and wilderness experience help maintain composure in the face of horror. Yet I'm struggling to suppress my natural instincts to run. Daily life never prepares you for this kind of monstrousness lurking outside normalcy's bounds. The more we discover these heinous atrocities unfolding before our eyes, the more evident something bloodthirsty lives here, preying upon innocent lives. As the foul stench intensifies around us, we barely notice a shifting shadow just beyond our flashlight beams. This menacing presence surrounds us slowly until facing it becomes impossible to avoid. There it stands, a gigantic humanoid wolf creature bearing its sharp canines while staring menacingly into our souls. Its gruesome visage boasts powerful muscles rippling beneath mottled fur, accompanied by snarling, elongated fangs dripping with drool and dark ooze. Looming above at least eight feet tall, it exudes a palpable presence of raw power and predatory intent. The beast lunges at us with breakneck speed, Felicity and Innes are grabbed right off their feet. I fire my gun directly at it, hoping to stop its rampage as Jonah and Sasha also grimly take aim. Our bullets seem ineffective against such a formidable being. The monster snatches Jonah next and transforming his fear into destructive fury. He throws his own life on the line to force an opening for Sasha and me to scamper away from this den of horrors. His scuffle with the creature becomes a deafening blend of growls, screams, 
gunfire and tearing sinew that echoes through my mind for miles. Frantically escaping into the trees with Sasha, we attempt reaching higher ground in search of any hope for survival or rescue. Fear grips our breath as every step feels calculated. Behind us, agonized wails still reverberate as the snarling beast turns its attention toward me. Sasha and I, hearts pounding, race through the dense forest as the sounds of destruction and torment follow us. Branches whip at our faces while we navigate the treacherous terrain, driven by instinct and adrenaline. The need for survival overpowers any sense of loyalty to our friends left behind, and we do not look back. As we dart between trees, Sasha spots a small cabin nestled in a clearing ahead. We approach cautiously, not wanting to draw any more attention to ourselves. The door is unlocked, and we slip quietly inside. What was that thing? Sasha whispers, eyes filled with terror. I don't know, I reply. But we need help. Clutching my phone tightly, I try calling 911 but find that there's no signal here in the depths of the forest. Panic rises inside me. What can we do if assistance is unreachable? Searching for anything that could be useful in the cabin, Sasha discovers a landline phone in the corner. With trembling fingers, she dials the emergency number. We're being attacked, Sasha tells the operator hurriedly. There's this wolf creature thing, and it already took three of our friends. The operator tries to remain calm while obtaining our location, but admits they have no information on what type of creature could be capable of such violence. They assure us help will be on its way soon. In an attempt at defense, Sasha and I barricade ourselves inside the cabin using whatever furniture we can find. With each moment that passes, fear engulfs us more and more. It becomes suffocating. We must trust that help is on its way, despite not understanding what or who can help us against this nightmarish villain. By some miracle, several hours pass with no signs of intrusion from the monster that hunts us. When local authorities arrive at the scene alongside heavily armed specialists who were briefed about our unknown attacker, we breathe a tentative sigh of relief. Sasha and I, exhausted from what seems like an eternity of fear, allow ourselves to be guided under their protection toward the nearest town. The rescue team search for any sign of our friends, but Jonah, Felicity, and Innes all remain unaccounted for. During the brief interrogation that follows our rescue, we recount the grim details of the creature and its attacks. Though law enforcement struggles to find a reasonable explanation for these events, experts suggest the possibility we encountered some sort of genetically mutated canine or a highly aggressive wildlife species not yet documented. I lean on this assumption, even if my gut tells me otherwise. Werewolves don't exist in reality, I try to remind myself that there must be an objective and rational explanation for our experience. But despite my skepticism, visions of those powerful muscles hidden within mottled fur and those terror-inducing fangs still haunt my dreams at night. Time passes as life tries to mend itself after the horrifying ordeal. Authorities never recover Felicity and Innes's bodies, nor manage to capture the beast responsible for their demise. We mourn them quietly among ourselves, forever haunted by those unforgettable screams. A year later, at a memorial service held in honor of our fallen friends, Sasha approaches me with hushed urgency in her voice. Have you heard? She asks quietly. There have been more attacks, just like what happened to us, on the other side of the country. The unsettling revelation sends shivers down my spine and my mind races with unanswered questions. Was this mutation turning into an epidemic? Is it even possible that such creatures exist among us in reality? But I push these thoughts aside as irrational fantasies. Regardless of my fears or concerns about new attacks making headlines nationwide, one thing is clear. Out there in that forest where Felicity and Innes died alongside Jonah's sacrifice lies a cruel reminder a terrifying reminder of an encounter with the unknown that will forever be burned into our memories. The service ends, 
and we each place a flower on the memorial for our friends. In that moment of silence and remembrance, I hold back tears. We don't know if what we faced was simply a freak of nature or something monstrous beyond anyone's current understanding, and maybe we never will. But I am determined to keep their memories alive, for they should not be forgotten. Not by time or fear. Not by the beast that stole their lives. I was on the verge of wrapping up another typical evening at my home in upstate New York. The year was 2018, and the crisp October air had begun to creep under the door when I first heard it, the sound that would change my life forever. It was a faint, echoing cry in the distance. At first I passed it off as a neighborhood child's laughing or playing, but something about it felt undeniably unsettling. My dog Otto, a faithful German shepherd, began to grow agitated. His ears perked up and he let out a low bark, not his usual joyful barking when he sees a friend or gets excited. This was a warning growl. Telling myself that I was overreacting, I decided to ignore it and continue getting ready for bed. As I slid between the cold sheets, I glanced out of my window at the surrounding woods. Everything seemed eerily still, even the branches of trees were frozen against the night sky. A misty fog started to envelop the area adding an extra layer of disquiet to my surroundings. The cries continued for several minutes, odd, chilling noises that crawled into my ear canal and refused to leave. Resigning myself to anxiety, I finally decided to step outside for a brief moment and see if I could find any trace of what was causing this uncanny disturbance. Creeping across my yard with Otto by my side, we could both sense something amiss in these usually peaceful woods that bordered our property. Just as Otto sniffed near an old oak tree's base, we heard it again, this odd laugh cry reverberating like someone in need, but masked by an eerie echo. The hairs on my neck prickled as we advanced slowly towards the source of the noise. Twigs crunched underfoot while leaves rustled in a breeze that felt sinister despite its gentle force. Suddenly, Otto stopped dead in his tracks and fixed his gaze on something that made my heart drop into the pit of my stomach. Before us stood a group of children with black eyes, their faces devoid of any expression as they stared at us. A shiver ran through me like an ice-cold wave crashing into my chest. What do you want? I stammered, fighting the instinct to flee back to the house. Their black eyes seemed empty, soulless. They refused to blink and continued their unsettling stare. The silence became unbearable alongside the suffocating fear. One of the children raised his arm slowly, pointing at me with a grotesque grin stretched across his face, something that chiseled fear deep into my bones. Time slowed down as Otto let out a protective bark, but I could see in his fearful, quivering stance that he was as terrified as I was. Stay back, I yelled with as much bravado as I could muster. My voice quivered, barely hiding my growing sense of panic. The child creatures let out a chorus of those same chilling laughs and screeches that had kept me awake earlier. One by one, they began to encircle us, causing Otto to snarl viciously at each approaching figure. Dread pulsed in my veins like a living thing fighting its way out of my body, while the sinister group tightened their circle around us. As they continued to move closer, their gaunt features and twisted smiles began to blur together in my vision. Gathering my courage and taking advantage of the adrenaline now coursing through me, I seized Otto's collar and bolted towards an opening in their ring. The only thing clear was that we needed to escape whatever twisted nightmare we had stumbled into, if escape was even possible. As Otto and I dashed through the narrow opening in the circle of black-eyed children, I could hear their laughter growing louder and more menacing. My heart pounded in my chest, and I tried to focus on guiding Otto through the dense forest without stumbling. When we finally reached our house, I fumbled with the keys before managing to unlock the door. Once inside, I locked all the windows and doors, making sure there were no possible points of entry for those children. Gasping for air, Otto paced nervously around the living room while I grabbed my cell phone from the kitchen counter. I debated whether to call for help or not, but who would believe me? How could I explain that a group of creepy black-eyed kids had encircled us, cackling away into the darkness? So instead, 
I decided to call my closest friend, Alex. Hey, you need to get over here, I said when Alex picked up. There's something strange going on in the woods behind my house. On my way, he replied without hesitation. With Alex on his way, I tried to calm down by setting Otto's food and water bowls out. The sound of his eating soothed me a little, until the sound of something against our window made both me and Otto freeze. The black-eyed children were outside our house now. They pressed their emotionless faces against every window pane they could reach, as though they thrived on creating fear within me. Otto snarled loudly and stared back at them while I remained paralyzed with fear. When Alex arrived fifteen minutes later, he barreled into our house. He shook off his disbelief as he glanced at my pale face, then saw the eerie children surrounding us outside. We're trapped, he shouted. We've got to do something. The idea of attempting escape crossed our minds several times as we stood there helplessly, watching their cold stares. But it was clear that the children would only move closer should we attempt to flee. With each passing minute, they grew increasingly bold, some testing the door locks, others tapping on windows more violently. The situation became so alarming that even Alex, usually unshakable in times of crisis, began to panic. Having considered all options and unable to rely on the police's help, we couldn't even begin to explain what was happening. We made an unexpected yet brave decision. Alex found flares and a fire extinguisher in the garage and handed one to me. We've got no other choice, he said grimly. We're going to fight our way out. We nodded and took a deep breath together before approaching the front door. The instant we stepped outside, the black-eyed children closed in on us, grinning maliciously. We ignited our flares, creating a blazing circle of fire around us. The crowd of children slowly withdrew from the searing flames. We took advantage of their momentary hesitation and sprinted away from the house, flares held in front of us like torches guiding us through darkness. As we ran, I gazed back at the haunting figures behind us and saw them gradually disappearing into the night. It took days before we ventured home again. We stayed at Alex's apartment until we could muster enough courage to face our own house. Upon returning home, now empty of sinister black-eyed children, we finally felt safe, almost as if that dark chapter in our lives had concluded. But as much as I wanted to forget those horrendous days, I couldn't help reminding myself that those children were still out there somewhere. One question constantly echoed in my mind. Could they come back? Neither Alex nor I ever spoke about what happened, just exchanged understanding looks filled with silent support and fear. Until one day, years later, when we reminisced about Otto, our fierce protector who died from old age, did we finally acknowledge our horrifying experience. But even then, we hardly spoke about those terrifying children with black eyes, knowing that within their mere memory lay a dark nightmare we just couldn't shake away. It was mid-April 1997 when the strangest thing happened to me. I was working as a park ranger in the Ozark Mountains, stationed near Devil's Den State Park. The days had been routine until that fateful run-in that forever changed my life. Nonetheless, I'll never forget the beginning of that experience. Back then, I would often regale my colleagues with tales of past misadventures, like the time I unintentionally insulted a voodoo priestess in New Orleans while on vacation. I mean, how was I supposed to know? She just looked like a quirky street vendor to me. I laughed and told everyone over lunch at our ranger station. Our team of rangers at the time included Danny, Maria, and myself. We were on our regular afternoon patrol along one of the hiking trails when we stumbled upon a rather disconcerting sight. An abandoned van, its rusty exterior scarred by scratches that appeared deliberate. Maria hesitated, visibly disturbed by the eerie find. Should we report this? She asked nervously. I shrugged in response. Let's check it out first and see if there's anything worth investigating. Cautiously but curiously, we began to explore the abandoned van. It was filled with torn clothes and haphazard camping supplies, clear signs that the owner had left in a hurry before meeting some sort of unknown fate. We contacted our supervisor for further instructions on how to proceed. Over the next few days, we continued our daily patrols, searching for any clues or signs of life related to that abandoned van. Something about it stuck with everybody, 
an unnerving aura that made our hair stand on end and had us losing sleep at night. One day, after weeks of feeling uneasy, Danny reported that he saw a figure observing him from far away during his night shifts. He reported that it stooped like an animal, yet was still humanoid in shape, with piercing eyes staring back at him, as if it were turning into the woods to disappear. The unsettling story got to Maria, who mustered up her limited courage and humorously asked if the mountain had its own little Bigfoot. Soon we started referring to this strange creature as our resident cryptid, half-jokingly speculating that our enigmatic visitor was some Ozark version of a folktale monster. Before long, there had been several additional sightings. It always seemed to watch from a distance, alerting us to its presence with gut-wrenching screams that echoed in the still night air. Oddly enough, it never appeared before me, even when I volunteered myself for more night shifts, as if drawn subconsciously to this unknown threat. On one dreadful evening, while out alone patrolling the wilderness in the company of nothing but crickets and a sense of foreboding that steadily grew in my gut, I finally encountered it. As I patrolled along the trail, the air grew colder, and an eerie silence fell over the area. The crickets had stopped their songs, and I noticed out of the corner of my eye a figure standing just beyond the reach of my flashlight. The creature was grotesque and abnormal in appearance. It was hunched over with unnaturally long limbs, its large eyes reflecting back a greenish hue in the dim light. I instinctively reached for my radio to call for backup, but froze when I realized that doing so might provoke this beast to attack. I tried to calm myself as I remembered my training and focused on observing any unusual behavior or movement from this creature. It started, moving its head in irregular patterns, tilting it to one side and then to another, as if trying to make sense of my presence. Suddenly, it let out an otherworldly screech, a mixture of a human wail and an animal's roar, that sent shivers down my spine. Before I could react, it lunged at me with its massive, sharpened claws that looked like they could tear through flesh with ease. As the claws lashed forward, I narrowly managed to dodge while drawing my sidearm. The creature snarled and hissed at me viciously before dashing back into the forest. I sprinted back to the ranger station, my heart pounding in my chest. When I burst inside, Danny and Maria stared at me in shock. Gasping for breath, I recounted what had happened. Maria blinked back tears while Danny clenched his fists in anger at our unknown foe. We have to find out what this thing is, Danny insisted but we can't do it alone. So we decided to seek help from experts in local folklore and contacted Dr. Joseph Henderson from a nearby university, an authority on regional myths and legends. Over the phone, Dr. Henderson listened patiently as we explained our encounters with this creature. When we described its appearance and the greenish glint in its eyes, he murmured almost to himself, so it is true. Returning his attention to us, he shared a chilling story from the local Native American tribe of an ancient monstrous being known as Olichiao, a vengeful spirit that had been disturbed by human presence and territorial encroachment. It seemed that the creature we encountered matched the description of this mythological beast. For several nights, our camp was on high alert, backups were called, and additional rangers arrived to help us patrol the park. Yet Olichiao remained elusive. Until one dreadful evening... As Danny, Maria, and I returned from a patrol near the park's perimeter, our eyes widened in horror as we noticed fresh claw marks on the outside of the station's walls. Everyone stay alert, I ordered through gritted teeth. We scrambled into action, each of us taking positions with our weapons poised and ready. The crunching of broken twigs signaled the approach of our adversary. A gut-wrenching screech pierced the night air as Olisho lunged at Maria. Danny and I fired simultaneously, our bullets finding their mark. Yet unbeknownst to us, Olisho could not be harmed by mortal weaponry. The bullets didn't seem to phase it. With a swift swipe of its claw, Maria collapsed to the ground, motionless. Rage built up inside me after seeing my fallen colleague. As Olisho leered menacingly at us, I stepped forward and took aim again, desperation driving my every move, knowing full well it wasn't rational yet being unable to accept defeat. Suddenly, a red flare shot into the sky just beside where Alicia stood, and it retracted instinctively from its intense light. In that momentary lapse of its attack, we grabbed Maria's body and retreated to the safety of the station. The beast did not pursue us. 
Over time, the encounters with Alicia ceased, and we were left to mourn the loss of our dear friend Maria. However, we knew that this creature remained out there, an ancient memory to remind us of nature's frightening mysteries still hidden deep within the forest. And so, with heavy hearts and cautious minds, we returned to our duties as park rangers, forever haunted by the spectral presence of Olitia lurking somewhere in the shadows. This happened to me about a decade ago, while on a road trip with my friend Anders in California. We decided to explore the Sierra National Forest in our Jeep, not realizing we were embarking on something horrifying. Driving through the trees, we admired the stunning scenery. A cozy diner near our cabin served us delicious homemade pie for dessert, indicating that this was meant to be a fun trip. I remember casually revealing that I had always been an only child and often sought adventures to fill my days. The next morning, Anders and I ventured off the beaten path, excited about discovering hidden gems in the vast wilderness. Several miles into the forest, we stumbled upon an abandoned campsite. Eerie vibes swirled as we noticed shredded tents and scattered belongings, including torn clothes stained with dried blood. Feeling uneasy, we decided to push further into the forest, but found ourselves being watched by a ragged man with piercing eyes and matted hair hidden in the shadows. We began to hike faster, hearts hammering in our chests. Suddenly, another stranger appeared before us, even more grotesque than the first one, brandishing a blood-soaked hatchet. It became evident that they were part of a larger group when eerie whistling echoed around us. We tried to call for help, but there was no signal deep in this wilderness. Fear surged like adrenaline as Anders and I sprinted away from our pursuers, desperate to escape from these evil mountain dwellers. Shadows shifted among them while they tortured unsuspecting travelers passing through their domain. Breathing heavily and covered in sweat, we managed to lose them briefly before stumbling upon a macabre sight. Human bones arranged like surreal decorations adorned tree branches, while skulls gazed sightlessly into the never-ending darkness of the forest. The evidence of horror became increasingly obvious as we realized that escape might not be easy. Clutching whatever makeshift weapons we could find, we tried to form a plan, noticing primitive traps scattered throughout the area. They were relentless in their pursuit, enjoying the sinister game of cat and mouse they had created for us. Cries in the distance signaled further victims captured by these savages, strengthening our resolve to escape their grasp. Time was running out, and as exhaustion threatened to overwhelm us, we knew it was now or never. Summoning our courage, we made our stand against this group of sadistic mountain men. Grappling with one of them, I looked into his wild eyes and saw pure malevolence consuming him. The fight became fierce as Anders cried out in pain, fresh blood staining his clothes. We fought tooth and nail against these monstrous beings who reveled in a life of violence and cruelty. Our once simple road trip had devolved into a desperate battle for survival. Our assailants were like hungry predators, eager to claim their prey in grisly fashion. Facing such unspeakable horrors, no time left for humor or light conversations. Pleading screams filled the air as our fellow travelers suffered at the hands of these degenerate beings. We knew they wouldn't stop until every last one of us was mangled beyond recognition, or worse. As I dashed through the trees towards an injured Anders, a hand grasped my ankle, slamming me into the ground hard enough to knock any rational thought from my head. I couldn't help but wonder if any place in this forest would ever be safe again with these cannibals lurking in the shadows, seeking human flesh with dark abandon. Our situation desperate and time slipping away, we fought with all our might against our sworn adversaries. The frantic struggle intensified as we realized that this could be our final battle against these deadly hunters who had already claimed so many victims. In the midst of this brutal confrontation, I realized that calling for help would do no good. We were deep in the heart of this cannibalistic territory, and none of us knew our exact location. Even if we managed to find some cell service, it seemed unlikely that anyone could reach us in time to make a difference. Our only hope was to work together and fend off these twisted mountain men long enough to escape. One of the cannibals swung an axe, barely missing my head as I ducked just in time. The sharp blade lodged itself into a nearby tree trunk, temporarily incapacitating him. 
another assailant leaped forward, brandishing a rusty chain he swung menacingly in our direction. The savage attackers were grotesque-looking men with unwashed hair and wearing filthy clothes made from animal skins. Their wiry beards were caked with dried blood, betraying their gruesome appetites. Their eyes burned with hunger and rage as they bared discolored teeth like feral animals. We had no choice but to defend ourselves. Our makeshift weapons consisted of rocks, sticks, and anything else we could find on the forest floor. We fought in pairs to protect each other's backs, an unspoken pact of solidarity forged by sheer terror. I teamed up with Anders, who had already sustained injuries, but was still determined to fight for his life. He was covered in cuts and bruises, but managed to keep going despite his pain. Together we worked in tandem to fend off these monstrous beings that roamed the wilderness. Our fellow travelers were engaged in similar battles around us, each person doing their best to repel the brutal onslaught from these cannibalistic hunters. I could see fear etched onto everyone's faces, but there was also a fierce determination not to become the next meal for these vile creatures. Somehow, against all odds, we began making progress towards escape. Fighting back to back, we managed to force our way through the cannibals. We made a run back towards the path we had wandered off from, never imagining that taking a wrong turn would have brought us face to face with this nightmare. As we headed deeper into the forest, tracked by our relentless foes, a few of our group fell prey to the cannibals. Screams of pain and fear echoed through the air as they were brutally attacked and killed their blood offering a horrifying contrast to the verdant greenery that surrounded us. Though we didn't have time to grieve for them, their deaths weighed heavily on all of us as we tried to survive. Fear gripped us, urging us to keep going even when our bodies threatened to give in to exhaustion. We knew there was no other option but to press on, putting distance between ourselves and these inhuman monsters. When daylight finally broke over the horizon, it seemed like nothing short of a miracle. The night had been seemingly endless, but at last, salvation appeared in the form of rescue helicopters hovering above. They had spotted our desperate smoke signals and arrived just as hope was beginning to dwindle. The remaining cannibals slunk back into the shadows, vanishing without a trace. Whether they feared being discovered or understood that their prey had been snatched from their grasp was unclear. But one thing was certain, they were still out there somewhere. Our unexpected encounter with these sadistic mountain men left deep scars, both physical and mental, on all of those who managed to survive. As we were lifted away from the grisly sight of our battle for life, I felt a mixture of relief and dread, knowing that those despicable creatures still roamed free. But as we rose higher into the sky and away from this nightmarish ordeal, another thought found its way through my shattered mind. Out there somewhere, there would be other weary travelers unknowingly taking a wrong turn, just like we had, and sealing their terrible fate. And until these monstrous beings were stopped, the terror would go on. It was a sweltering summer afternoon in July 2003 when my friends and I decided to meet up for a reunion camping trip. Mark Johnson, Michael Reynolds, Danny Baker, Lisa Simmons and I, all high school buddies, had not seen each other for years, and it was the perfect opportunity to reconnect. We chose Shade State Park in Indiana because of its picturesque landscape, which allowed us to escape the city's buzz for a weekend. I'm not sure I'll be able to survive without Wi-Fi, Lisa jokingly groaned as she loaded her backpack into the trunk of my car. You'll manage? Danny playfully shoved her shoulder. Besides, it's only two days. On our way there, we were laughing and exchanging stories about our lives thus far. The conversation eventually veered towards scary, real-life encounters. Well, just last month, there was a guy in my apartment building who had an allergic reaction to his throat lozenges. I died on the spot, Michael recounted. Ew, that's so gross. Lisa cringed at the thought, but thankfully she had no idea what awaited us all. We arrived at our campsite just before sunset, thrilled with adrenaline and excitement. After pitching our tents and starting a campfire, we began grilling some dinner while the sky darkened across the rolling hills. After filling ourselves with delicious hot dogs, 
we huddled around the fire, sipping on cold beer and reminiscing fondly about the old days. Soon after, Mike noticed something strange in the trees surrounding our campsite. Through squinted eyes, he said, There's someone watching us, or something. We fell silent for a moment, but then burst into laughter, brushing it off as a typical tall tale meant to scare us into submission. Typical Mike. The first day rolled on without incident. We went hiking, swimming, and even did some bird watching. Our relaxation could not have been more complete, or so we thought. As night fell on the second day, everything took a drastic turn for the worse. We were just sitting down after roasting marshmallows for s'mores when Lisa shrieked at the slight rustling she heard in the bushes. We turned our flashlights in its direction and caught a glimpse of something horrifying, a silhouette of a person with an unnaturally twisted form standing amongst the trees. In that instant, it fled, but we were left shaken and unsettled. Mark attempted to shake us out of our stupor. It was probably just some deer or another camper. None of us, however, were convinced. In fact, we decided that it was best to pack up and leave first thing in the morning, taking no chances with this sinister presence. As we sat inside our tents that night, none of us could fight off the lingering fear that enveloped us. All we could hear were our breaths as we attempted to get some rest before tackling the new day. Suddenly, a violent scream shattered the silence, followed by a sickening crunch. In an instant, all four of us darted out of our tents and rushed towards the blood-curdling scream's source, which happened to be Lisa's tent. The sight that met our eyes was gruesome beyond belief. Lisa's body lay lifelessly on the ground with her arm bent at an impossible angle. Now panicking, Michael frantically checked her pulse. She's still alive, he cried out, wiping tears from his eyes. That's when Mark noticed something further away, a trail of irregular footprints leading into the dense forest surrounding our campsite. We decided to follow the trail of footprints, hoping to find out what had happened and who was responsible. As we ventured farther into the forest, we came across a man staggering towards us. He looked disheveled and shaken. Help me, he pleaded weakly. I managed to escape from him, but he's still back there. Who's he? Michael asked urgently. Crazy Jeremiah, the man answered breathlessly. I heard rumors about him living in these woods, but I never thought they were true until I saw him with my own eyes. Our hearts raced as we listened to him describe Crazy Jeremiah, a tall, scarred man with wild hair and a haggard appearance. His face was marked by years of living in the wilderness, making him even more terrifying to behold. He was known for his unpredictable nature and violent tendencies, which earned him a notorious reputation among the locals. We continued deeper into the woods with caution, looking over our shoulders constantly for any signs of Crazy Jeremiah. Soon we came across a small abandoned cabin. That must be where he lives, Danny said quietly, pointing at the building. As we approached the cabin, we noticed several sinister items scattered around it. Rusty chains, a bloody axe, and hunting traps. There was no doubt that this was Crazy Jeremiah's lair. Suddenly, a loud scream gave us chills. It was coming from inside the cabin. Cursing under our breaths, we burst through the door and found ourselves in a dimly lit room filled with the most horrifying sight any of us had ever seen. People were chained to the walls or lying on makeshift beds, battered, bruised, and covered in filth. In the midst of this gruesome scene stood Crazy Jeremiah himself. He turned to face us with a sinister grin, revealing yellowed teeth. Michael quickly stepped forward and swung his flashlight at Crazy Jeremiah's head, knocking him unconscious. Without wasting time, we untied the captive victims and led them out of the cabin. After making sure that everyone could walk or at least limp, we began to make our way back to our campsite. Suddenly, we heard a loud thud behind us and realized that Crazy Jeremiah was gone from the cabin. He had somehow managed to escape our clutches and vanished without a trace. That madman is still out there, Mark whispered with a shudder. As all of us hurriedly returned to our campsite with the victims, 
We couldn't shake off the chilling feeling that crazy Jeremiah was watching us from afar. Even as we got back into our vehicles and drove away, our gazes kept darting back to the dense forest that hid our nightmares. Crazy Jeremiah was still at large, and though we had managed to save these innocent people, our brief brush with this wicked man left us haunted by an unshakable sense of terror. As we drove on, one question lingered in our minds. Would anyone ever be able to stop him? I woke up startled, a sound outside my window grabbing my attention. My name's Tamias Whitebird, and I'm a park ranger working at the Black Hills National Forest in South Dakota. This was not how I expected to spend my evening off from work. Being a Native American with roots in the Lakota tribe, I had always felt a deep connection to these lands, but never came across anything as eerie as that night. Hesitant, I grabbed my flashlight and progressed cautiously through the forest, driven by an unexplainable urge to investigate. A friend of mine, Lisa Benton, had gone missing days ago, and her disappearance weighed heavily on my mind. We shared fond memories of exchanging stories about our unique backgrounds. I chuckled to myself at the thought of the joking conversation we had, discussing how our surnames are rarely heard of. Little did I know how soon that feeling would be replaced by something far more sinister. As I continued moving further into the woods, the sky darkened overhead and cast an unsettling glow over everything around me. The tree branches reached out like skeletal fingers, as if trying to grab onto whatever walks by their side. Slowly but surely, a stench filled the air, vile and putrid that made my stomach churn. As I pushed away the bile rising in my throat, it became increasingly clear that something was terribly wrong here. Driven by a determination to find Lisa, I covered my nose with my shirt and pressed forward. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon a gruesome scene. A human body lay there mangled and distorted beyond recognition. There was carnage everywhere, limbs strewn apart, dried blood collecting in dark pools covering every inch of the forest floor. At this moment, I should have called for help but something lodged in my throat choked down any courage left within me. Besides, the closest base was miles away, and this situation demanded immediate attention. As I stepped away with trembling legs to analyze the area, I spotted faint footprints embedded in the ground. It was followed by a blood trail leading into the dense thicket. Cautiously, I decided to follow the trail when abruptly something crashed through the foliage. Struggling to keep my composure, I gripped my flashlight tightly, and shone it towards the sound. A creature not of this world stood before me, horrifying scales covering its body, several arms and legs with talons scything through the air, and black eyes that seemed to contain an abyss that chilled me to my very core. Paralyzed by fear, a flood of thoughts raced through my mind, each too complex to fully grasp yet equally terrifying, when suddenly a deafening roar filled my ears. I knew that survival was all that mattered now. Hoping for a fighting chance, I scrambled into action. The creature lunged at me with impressive speed, but I was quicker this time and rolled aside. Failing to find its target, ravenous hunger gleamed from its eyes. It swiftly spun around and flailed its icy claws in anticipation. Seizing an opportunity amidst retreats, spectacular leaps and dodging razor-sharp talons, our movements resembled an intricate dance where one misstep could lead to a fatal conclusion. In our brutal exchange of offense and defense, I noticed something peculiar. The beast recoiled when passing an area filled with torches illuminating my surroundings. It was then that a sliver of hope appeared. I spent years learning about these reservations and their legends, but never thought any of them could be true. Knowing that many tribes used fire not only for protection, but also for rituals against evil spirits within our culture, it dawned on me how essential it would be to create a barrier between myself and whatever creature this may be. I knew it wouldn't guarantee survival, as this being possessed strengths and abilities unrivaled, but the look of dread within its eyes temporarily subsided my own fear. As I snatched a torch from its holder, it became clear that this creature wanted to stalk me no matter where I went, a foe with relentless dedication, but who still longed for shadows to swallow it whole. With the torch in my hand, I tried to keep a safe distance between myself and the creature, using it as a makeshift barrier. 
My heart pounded as I backed away, my eyes fixated on the beast's appearance. Its massive form was covered in a dark, matted fur, and its snout filled with crooked teeth, gnashing hungrily at the air. Its limbs were long and muscular, ending in icy claws that threatened to shred anything within its reach. As I found my back against a rock wall, panic began to set in. It seemed impossible to escape this relentless predator. Suddenly I remembered my cell phone tucked into my pocket. Desperate for help, I pulled it out and managed to dial 911 with shaky fingers. 911, what's your emergency? The operator's voice came over the line. Please help. There's a... a creature attacking me, I blurted out. What's your location? I'm not sure. I was out hiking near some tribal lands, reservation territory, when this thing came after me. I described the monster as best as I could while continually waving the torch at it in an attempt to hold it at bay. We're sending help to your location immediately, the operator said. Just try to stay safe. Holding onto my lifeline connection with emergency personnel, I began to search frantically for some kind of escape route. When I noticed an opening that led into a cave just behind me, I knew it was my best bet, even if it might be temporary. As soon as I entered the cave, the dim glow from the torch revealed intricate wall markings, which seemed to be older tribal inscriptions etched by hand. If ever there was a clue about what this stalking creature might be, or where it originated from, there would undoubtedly be some truth hidden within these markings. The cave became exceedingly narrow, reaching a dead end after a few minutes of walking. It was too dark to continue further. The distinctive growls and heavy breathing of the monster approached, echoing through the winding passage. My hope quickly diminished as I realized there was no escape. But then, as I huddled against the furthest wall, shining the torchlight on the ancient carving surrounding me, I caught a glimpse of something meaningful. In that moment, I found strength in speaking out loud to the creature. I know what you are, I yelled from deep within my lungs in a last desperate attempt. A high-pitched cry came from the beast upon hearing my words, causing it to halt its stalking advances momentarily. Seizing this chance, I abandoned my fear and faced it head on, torch held high, refusing to be devoured by this monstrous being. Strangely enough, as I stood there prepared for battle against whatever it would bring forth next, the creature simply stared at me a curious expression on its twisted face. I didn't move an inch, neither did it. I held my ground until flashing lights appeared outside the cave's entrance. My hope surged with renewed vigor when emergency services finally arrived on the scene. The beast, whatever it was and wherever it had come from, fled with a snarl as more lights shone upon it and human voices echoed around us. The 911 dispatcher asked me if everything was still okay. My trembling response confirmed that help arrived just in time. While unsure of what exactly chased me that night, or why simply acknowledging its presence and existence seemed to halt its pursuit of me, one thing became clearer. Never had I been so grateful for genuine human connection when faced with indescribable terror, an abomination violently thrusting me out of my otherwise mundane existence. From that day forward, each time I went out into nature or merely glanced at those old inscriptions etched into my memory, I couldn't help but remember that horrific encounter, the defeated creature slinking away in the face of knowledge and unity. Would it ever emerge again, or would the shadows continue to provide it refuge? In the summer of 1997, during my time as a park ranger in the Ozark Mountains, I had an unforgettable experience that still haunts me to this day. My job was to patrol the forest, check for any fire hazards, clear paths, and help any wandering hikers along the way. Unfortunately, that summer would prove to be more disturbing than any other. On July 8th, I stumbled upon a gruesome scene while patrolling a secluded area of the forest. The first thing I noticed was the scent in the air. It was an overwhelming blend of coppery blood and decay, almost making me gag. A cold sweat appeared on my brow as I turned the corner and saw numerous trees smeared with blood from top to bottom. It looked like some kind of twisted artwork that one could only imagine in their worst nightmares. Suspicious and worried, I cautiously moved forward and discovered something even more horrifying. 
a human arm torn from its socket lying on the ground. The arm appeared pale and shredded, with bone fragments protruding from various angles. A pit formed in my stomach as my mind raced through every possible scenario that could lead to this gruesome discovery. Radioing in for backup, I tried not to sound scared when explaining what had happened. As I waited for assistance, the sound of rustling leaves caught my attention. Peering through the trees, I spotted an odd figure moving in the distance. It was tall and shambled slowly like something not entirely human. My colleagues arrived about twenty minutes later and examined the gory scene before we moved deeper into the forest, following a trail of destruction. My heart pounded heavily against my chest as paranoia began to set in. What could have done this? How much danger were we in? Along our search, we met an elderly man named Jim, who had been hiking nearby when he heard something unusual deep within the forest. He claimed that he'd seen something he couldn't quite describe, a creature emitting an unnatural, guttural scream that echoed through the woods. It had moved with such incredible speed and agility that it sounded like a wild animal, but its vocalizations were almost human-like in nature. We all exchanged worried glances. I felt a shiver run down my spine as the fear of what we might find gripped us. Determined to find answers, we pushed onward. A sickly sweet smell continued to permeate the air around us, intensifying as we neared a clearing where it seemed the blood trail ended. In an instant, everything went debatably silent. Even the usual chirping of the birds was absent. My instinct screamed at me to run from this horrifying place, but my curiosity got the best of me. As we stood there in shock and disbelief, we heard Jim mutter in terror. I followed his gaze across the clearing and saw its ghastly figure standing tall and imposing against the backdrop of the forest, a creature covered in matted fur with elongated limbs that seemed unnatural even for such a large animal. It snarled, revealing razor-sharp teeth dripping with saliva. Fear surged through my body as we all slowly backed away from this abomination. It appeared to be studying us while remaining eerily still, which only heightened our dread. With each step we took backward, it was as if time slowed down, and our chances of escaping felt more and more impossible. My sudden cough echoed through the air like a gunshot, catching both my colleagues and the unknown creature off guard. It let out an ear-piercing shriek that resonated throughout my core before lunging forward with incredible speed, furiously clawing at our retreating figures like a mad animal possessed. My legs moved faster than they ever had before as I prayed that any moment now, I would wake up from this horrible dream and find myself safe in my cabin. My fellow rangers sprinted alongside me, their faces contorting in pure panic as we tried our hardest to put as much distance as possible between us and this monster. We eventually stumbled upon a nearby cave, exhausted and panting, our backs against the cold stone. Despite the danger we had just faced, we had somehow managed to escape the clutches of the violent and grotesque creature, at least for now. My fellow rangers tried to catch their breath while Jim asked, with concern in his voice, What on earth was that? Before anyone could answer Jim's question, a distant but familiar voice called out from behind us. It belonged to an old resident of the nearby village named Betty. She approached cautiously, her eyes wide with disbelief as she noticed our ragged appearances. I have tried to warn people before, but no one believed me, Betty stated in a trembling voice. I know what that beast is. It's the Mothman. We exchanged skeptical looks amongst each other before deciding it was in our best interest to investigate further. Over the next few days, under constant threat of attack, we delved into the chilling legend of the Mothman, an ancient folklore creature known to inhabit remote areas and terrorize whoever ventured too close to its lair. We found old newspaper articles and spoke with other locals who claimed to have encountered it. They described it as a vicious killer that would brutally mutilate its victims. As we realized the devastating force with which it was capable, we knew we must carefully strategize our next move in order to keep safe and subdue this antagonist while maintaining any semblance of sanity. It wasn't long before we noticed mysterious markings etched into trees, crude symbols smeared in blood and scratches where no human could reach. In hopes of better understanding its origins and motives, we sought out Betty once more. She explained that the Mothman had been part of their village folklore for years and informed us about some old texts containing references on how to ward off this monstrous being without resorting violently to combat. Our best option, 
was to create a diversion to lead the Mothman away from the village. Doing so would prevent any needless harm to innocent lives. We put our plan into motion, lighting a series of fires in a distant clearing. The hope was that the flames would draw the creature's attention away from its current hunting grounds. After a sleepless night spent on high alert, we finally saw the creature in the distance, attracted to our carefully crafted diversion. As it disappeared from view, we let out a collective sigh of relief before making our way back to assess our work. Venomous in nature, this victory was shrouded with an air of bitterness as we remembered those who had fallen victim to the Mothman's unfathomable rage and destruction. The images haunted us as we returned to our everyday lives. Despite our success in driving the creature away, an unsettling and eerie atmosphere lingered. This traumatizing experience served as a constant reminder that some things are simply beyond our comprehension or control. As time passed and new park rangers took over from us, we could never fully shake off the paranoia that one day, despite all our efforts, the Mothman might reappear, waiting for any unsuspecting victims who chanced upon its path. Later that year, I left my job as a park ranger behind. Sometimes it seemed like it was only a matter of time until those horrifying events would come back to haunt me. But one thing I'll always remember is that chilling night where we fought back against an unstoppable terror and survived the wrath of the one known as Mothman. It all started with a strange, off-putting smell that seemed to be coming from nowhere. My morning routine was pretty simple. Grab a cup of coffee, check my emails, and ponder about the mundane details of life. Little did I know that everything would change in an instant. My name is Sam Corbin, and I'm not your everyday hero or crime solver. I'm just a regular guy who prefers to keep a low profile. But what happened that fateful month of October 2014 forced me into a situation beyond my comprehension. Now, the small town of Slidell, Louisiana isn't your typical thriller scene. For the most part, it's just an ordinary, sleepy town where people go about their day-to-day -day lives without much fuss. However, that was all about to change when I first encountered those peculiar children. It began one evening after a long day of work at the local library. As I locked up and headed towards my car in the parking lot, I felt a sudden gust of wind that carried an eerie chill. That's when I saw them three children standing underneath a solitary lamppost near the edge of the woods. As I approached them cautiously, their features became clearer under the dim light. They looked small and frail with their dark clothes clinging to their bodies. But what struck me the most were their eyes, completely black like voids that seemed to pierce right through me as they stared unblinkingly. Are you lost? I managed to choke out hesitantly. They didn't respond and simply continued to fixate on me with deadpan expressions until one of them broke away from the group and walked towards me slowly. The fear inside me grew as he closed in. His eyes remained cold and emotionless. What do you want? I asked, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to calibrate what motives these children might have. The boy stopped an arm's length away from me and tilted his head like a curious animal. He opened his mouth, revealing sharp, glistening teeth as though they were knives ready to slice through flesh. A potent mix of sweat and blood emanated from him, sending my senses into overdrive. Before I could collect my thoughts or react rationally, the child moved at an alarming speed and clamped down onto my arm with his teeth. I fought back the urge to vomit from the pain that shot through me, a gut-wrenching blend of fire and ice that made my vision swim for a moment. I stumbled backward, pulling my arm free with surprising force. The pain was intense, but not enough to distract me from noticing the way the other children inched closer without ever moving their focus from me. Stay back, I shouted weakly as I made my way into my car, fumbling for the keys before speeding out of the library parking lot. They remained standing there motionless under the lamppost as I frantically tried to comprehend what had just transpired. Over the next few days, those children haunted my dreams and waking thoughts wrestling for power over my sanity. I began questioning whether this was a prank designed to push me over the edge or something more sinister. As days turned into weeks, townspeople started sharing their own harrowing experiences with these mysterious children 
each encounter more horrific than the one prior. The chilling tales of maimed victims bore striking similarities, excruciating pain followed by deep delirium and eventually death. With Slidell consumed by fear, reality appeared to be rapidly deteriorating around us. Desperate for answers, a small group of locals formed an alliance with one goal in mind, put an end to this nightmare before it consumed everything we knew. These encounters occurred mostly at night. We knew we had to act fast before another unsuspecting soul was claimed by their bloodlust. Rocked by a newfound sense of urgency, we planned an intervention. The moon was full, and the clock ticked past midnight as we found ourselves back at that same lamppost near the woods. The familiar. Smell of rotting flesh assailed our senses, and there they stood, waiting. We cautiously approached the group of black-eyed children, holding makeshift weapons and trying our best to mask our fear. They stood eerily still, not uttering a word or acknowledging our presence. A cold, tense silence enveloped us. Ignore them and walk away, pleaded one of the locals behind me. I considered the suggestion, knowing that challenging them could only exacerbate the situation. But then I remembered the horrifying stories of innocent people being tormented by these small but menacing creatures. No, I replied firmly. We need to confront this now. My heart pounded as I took one step forward, gripping a baseball bat tightly in my hands. One of the children tilted his head and cracked a twisted smile as if mocking my courage. The others followed suit, their soulless eyes trained on me like predators stalking prey. Despite my resolve, my legs felt weak and shaky. Suddenly, one by one, they started to advance toward us. Though they never made a sound or picked up their pace, their relentless approach felt menacing all the same. Call for help! I yelled at one of the group members beside me, while another swung a tire iron at the closest child. To our shock, it simply bounced off him with no visible effect. My friend took out his cell phone and managed to call 911, despite his trembling hands. Something's wrong with these kids. They're dangerous and won't leave us alone. We don't know what to do, he said in a desperate voice. As we backed away from them, panic spread through our group like wildfire. Every attempt we made to fend them off seemed useless. Their unnatural strength and resilience was overwhelming. Soon, sirens blared in the distance. Our call had been answered. Help was on its way. Yet the children never ceased their pursuit. We found ourselves pressed against a dead-end alley with nowhere else to retreat. The police cars screeched to a halt, and officers jumped out with guns drawn. They quickly analyzed the situation, and recognizing the threat, ordered the black-eyed children to halt their pursuit. But the children just stared at them with those lifeless eyes. That's when I saw it. A glint of fear in one officer's eyes as he looked from the child to my frightened allies. I realized in that moment that these creatures had instilled such a primal fear in all of us that not even the police felt safe confronting them. The standoff dragged on for what felt like hours, our fear fueling the tension that hung in the air. Finally, one officer took a deep breath and fired his gun at a child advancing on him. In a sickening twist of fate, it had no effect. Let's go, he yelled. We need reinforcements. We have no way of fighting them. As they retreated, so did the children. They suddenly turned around and disappeared into the night without a glance back at us. The following days were wrought with confusion and despair. The police were at a loss as to how to deal with these seemingly unbeatable opponents, and our small town lived in fear of when they would strike again. Conversations overheard in diners and grocery stores revolved around friends lost during this gruesome ordeal. In time, things began to change. News broadcasts shared sightings of similar groups in neighboring towns. We weren't alone in our suffering. This prompted responses from higher authorities who vowed to take action against the threat. Though their origin remains a mystery, we know now that these creatures have touched too many lives for us ever to forget what happened. We mourn those we've lost, but through our shared experience of fear and grief, we are also reminded of how precious life truly is. And every now and then when we see a group of children playing or walking through town together, we cautiously look into their eyes, praying that we never again encounter the black-eyed ones. My name is Carter Johnson, 
and I'm standing in the dense Appalachian forest, feeling the nerve-wracking stillness as I wait for my fellow hunters. We're part of a specialized task force notorious for tracking and hunting monsters that pose a threat to humanity. As we set out on our secret mission, I recall my personal experience growing up on a simple farm in rural Georgia. It's important for me to remain down to earth and focused on our objective. The task force is filled with people like me, people who faced monstrous tragedies and managed to come out stronger. The team consists of Marvin Walker, our marksman, Lee Morgan, an expert tracker, and Sasha Ivanov, our communication officer. We work like clockwork, with each person taking the responsibility they were assigned. Our faith in one another is what makes us strong, even when faced with unspeakable horrors. Before long, we reach a gruesome scene. Several missing persons from the nearby town had been eviscerated in a brutal attack. I fight back the bile rising in my throat. Nothing could prepare us for something so disturbing. After analyzing the evidence left behind at the scene, Lee deduces the direction in which the monster had escaped, leading us deeper into the woods. The terrain becomes treacherous as thick vegetation consumes our path and tensions rise among us as we tighten our grip on guns. Suddenly, we hear rustling leaves and shallow breaths cut through the deafening silence of the night. From behind an ancient oak tree, emerges an enormous creature that I had never laid eyes upon before. Its flesh peels from its muscular frame as it lumbers towards us with unnatural speed. Its massive claws leave deep grooves in the forest floor, while oversized fangs protrude from a grotesque maw that stretches wider than seems possible. As adrenaline courses through me, I grasp firm onto my weapon only to realize it's useless against such an otherworldly opponent. Marvin fires several shots into the beast's chest, the sound echoing like thunder through the treetops, but it barely falters as my heart sinks from a fleeting ray of hope. Protect the others, I yell, charging at the creature in an act of desperation. Using my training to execute a series of strategic maneuvers, I draw its attention, giving my teammates enough time to call for backup. I'm acutely aware that their help won't arrive soon enough. It's up to me and this twisted dance with death. As the nightmarish monster lunges for my exposed throat, I barely dodge out of its reach in time. I curse under my breath, not because the task force shouldn't have been warned about this monster's existence, but because it didn't seem like anything that could exist on this earth at all. As though picking up on my thoughts, Sasha exclaims over our communication device with shaky breath, Guys! Reports say it could be a skinwalker, a creature that can transform into any animal shape. The menacing creature continues its relentless assault, and we fight back with everything we've got. Panic and disbelief fuel our adrenaline, forcing us to dig deeper for survival than ever before. Amidst the life-or-death chaos, creeping doubt snags at the back of our minds. Is this truly a skinwalker? Could they even exist as more than folklore? Logic and reason battle against what stands before us as we try to make sense of what seems to defy explanation. But there's no time for lingering uncertainty. The onslaught doesn't relent. It only increases in intensity as hairs stand on end and primal fear courses through every beat of our hearts. We edge closer to desperate despair. Every shot fired seems futile as they only serve to push us past our limits. Even if we survive this night, how can we ever feel safe again? In those dark moments, our communication device crackles to life, finality sinking heavy in Sasha's choked-out words. Backup is still too far out. It's up to us. Realizing that backup would not arrive in time, our team had to work together to confront this monstrous creature. We could no longer afford to dwell on whether or not it was a skinwalker. Our sole focus was on survival. I glanced over at Sasha while evading another vicious lunge and tried to convey the urgency in my eyes. We need to find a way to slow it down at least, Sasha said, searching for any possible weakness in the monster. Let's try something unconventional, I yelled across the fray as we continued our feeble attempts at repelling the creature from attacking us. 
If it can change its shape, perhaps we can trick it into transforming into something less dangerous. We decided to call for help one last time before enacting our desperate plan. We didn't know why our calls were going unanswered, but this idea seemed like the only viable option to survive. Much like a pack of animals drawing in a predator, we all moved closer together. As the creature lunged at us again, we swiftly moved aside and scattered, forcing the monstrosity into a dead-end trap of its own creation. Feigning injury, I shouted, Guys, it bit me! I think... I think I'm turning into... into something. The others joined, forcefully pantomiming excruciating pain while groaning and collapsing wordlessly on the ground. As hoped, this apparent weakness piqued the creature's interest. It hesitated before adopting a more defensive stance. It studied us with its glowing eyes that seemed disturbingly human while we writhed and twisted on the ground, pretending to suffer some unknown transformation. The ploy worked. The creature grew agitated and confused by our transformation display. It suddenly let out an ear-splitting screech and shifted form in front of our eyes. Instead of the gargantuan terror that was attacking us moments ago, a human-like figure stood, bewildered. Seizing the opportunity, we quickly overcame our shock and sprinted towards one of the task force's armed vehicles parked nearby. We could hear the sounds of the confused, human-like creature behind us, but he didn't follow, perhaps still disoriented from our trick. With shaky hands, I locked the doors and started the engine. My team members, tired and weary from the chaos, exhale in relief as we sped away from what could have been our demise. The creature had turned into something far less threatening thanks to our last-ditch effort. Once at a safe distance, we reported back to headquarters about the terrifying encounter and our narrow escape. What they told us brought us to a halt. Other specialized teams, like ours, had encountered similar monsters that defied explanation. It seemed that this was only the beginning. Days passed, and we mourned those who had fallen to the creature's relentless assault. We struggled to comprehend what we had seen and whether it was an isolated incident or indicative of something more sinister. Measures were taken to ensure that backup wouldn't be delayed again like that fateful day. As news spread about these mysterious creatures, whispers grew about a new threat looming over humanity. But despite our fear, one thing became certain. Faced with an unknown enemy, it was up to us to adapt and survive. In the end, it took just days for these terrifying incidents became all but forgotten, despite shreds of evidence collected by specialized teams like ours. What these creatures were portrayed might be forever out of reach for ordinary people to comprehend or even know existed. However, in those darkest moments when primal fear takes hold, as though rooted deep within humanity's shared memory, with each hair standing on end like an antenna, we would remember everything about that night. The glowing eyes filled with malice lurking only inches from annihilation. How fragile life seemed as we came face to face with the stuff of nightmares. And we would truly appreciate that even though we couldn't eradicate evil completely, we could learn to adapt and survive. For those who knew the true face of terror, the horrors would never be forgotten.